Well, I think we're ready to, to start. Um, so welcome everyone for this uh, webinar. So the, the webinar called Forward Osmosis FO. Uh, you will see a lot of time this abbreviation in, in this uh, webinar for in the water sector. And the idea is to um, provide some return of experience and new application, both uh, more at the, at the lab scale, but also some pilot large scale uh, implementation on, on forward osmosis. Um, basically, this dissemination event is in the, the context of um, the Techno Spring project, which I'm working on. So I'm Gaetan Blanda, and I'm, I'm working at uh, Recat. The, the project itself, it's called Submerged for Water Osmosis for Water in the Circular Economy. And well, I will give a, a short presentation at the end of this webinar regarding this project, but it has been funded by um, a Technospring grant, postdoctoral grant, uh, which is co-funding from European Union and uh, the government of Catalonia. But the idea is not just to uh, disseminate about this project. It's the, the objective, in fact, we had a conversation, I think it was two years ago, before the COVID, um, with Professor Sean, and the idea was to try to gather together the FO community, especially in Europe, because there hasn't, hasn't been, I think, any uh, FO-oriented um, webinar or conference uh, recently in Europe especially and to try to disseminate the last research and innovation project to see where we are now with uh, FO especially in the context of uh, of water recycling desalination and so on and the initial idea was to make a joint event with the Roman brain uh, that was supposed to be held in September uh, at this moment, basically in Copenhagen. Finally, a Roman brain has been delayed. And like this uh, webinar is, uh, is an alternative to this attempt. And I hope that will be a good opportunity to, to connect uh, all people, all FO community, and also to to, to disseminate the result for water utilities. Um, basically, um, there, are where there are 87 people registered and uh, from 22 countries. So um, thanks everyone for connecting. And uh, even if it's maybe late at night or early in the morning for, for some of you, uh, we have a good mix of private company, research and innovation center like RedCat or university. And I wanted to acknowledge uh, the Catalan Water Partnership and also the Mandarin Society of Australia, of Australasia for disseminating and doing a, a bit of advertisement to, to give the, you the opportunity to be present today. So basically the agenda is the following one. Um, we will have, uh, after the welcome session, Xavier Martinez will make a, a short presentation of uh, ERICAT. And then we will start with the first session um, oriented towards uh, pilot scale, uh, industrial return of experience of forward osmosis. We will have a second session uh, on fundamental aspects and new approach and finally a round table. So there will be four presentations per session. What we will ask you if you have any question is to write them on the chat. And at the end of the session, you will, we will um, um, address you, your questions uh, with, the, with the presenters. And uh, well, I hope it will work well and that you will uh, learn a lot of uh, new things. And um, now we will start with the presentation of Ericat Xavi, if you can take yeah. and pre share you whatever you have to share. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll try to do so, just one second. Do you see my screen? Yes. Uh, just just one second because I have a video and and I need to share the 
the sound tool now again here we go let me see if i can do it in full screen do you see it yes good uh great great so so thank you very much Gaetan. thank you for organizing this this workshop this this conference but also thank you very much for for choosing us to to be the, during these two years of of TechnoSpring grant and and to um, uh, provide us uh, with uh, such uh, an amount of of knowledge of this amazing technology which is uh, forward osmosis. My name is Xavier Martinez Ledo. I'm currently the director of the technological unit water, air, and soil, and at Eureka. And uh, I'll try to summarize what, what it is Eureka and what uh, we are trying to do. Our main mission is to promote uh, business and, and, and well, business competitiveness uh, of especially the, the, the companies uh, and also the well-being of societies through applied research and uh, innovation. And if an image is uh, worth uh, a thousand uh, words, I think that the video is, is worth a million images. So uh, if you, I will show you the, 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 the corporate In video. In today's world, marked by technological transformation and fierce competition at a global level, innovation is a key factor both in products and services, manufacturing processes, logistics and communication techniques, always taking account of business challenges, but also environmental and social needs. To meet these objectives, it is essential to have the support of top-class technological partners to provide you with specialised complementary values. This is the prime mission of Eurocat, Catalonia's technological centre, to help you innovate. Whether you are an entrepreneur, an institution, or a small, medium, or large business, we bring you cutting-edge technological solutions that will help you enhance your competitiveness. To achieve this, we have more than 600 professionals working on applied research and innovation projects for and with companies. We are a dynamic, flexible organization with great coverage throughout the region, which facilitates direct dialogue with all our partners. At Euracat, we work in a wide range of fields and technological disciplines, enabling us to help you whatever your sector may be. In addition, we have state-of-the-art facilities and infrastructure, including the Laboratory of the Future, the Big Data Center of Excellence in Barcelona, the largest pilot plant for new plastic transformation technologies in Southern Europe, and the Omic Sciences Center. We collaborate with companies to create joint industrial research units and shared laboratories, enabling us to tackle even more ambitious challenges. We are a highly specialized, internationally recognized knowledge generating center oriented to results. We have alliances with universities and leading research centers to systematize and foster transfer technology developed in these institutions to the market, complementing the services we offer with their specialized knowledge. We regularly produce international patents in different fields and promote the creation of technology-based companies that contribute to reintegrating industry in the region, stimulating economic growth and generating high-quality jobs. In doing so, we at Euracat are helping to train the professionals of the future, both within the company itself and in our own facilities, by offering a highly specialized range of services and organizing scientific and technological outreach activities. Today, we have already established a solid reputation for applied research and technological innovation among over 1,500 companies with which we want to create strong, lasting alliances. Because we are convinced that the applied science of today is the innovative technology of tomorrow, and we believe there is no better way of achieving success than by working together. Euracat, innovating with businesses, innovating with you. So this is us. Sorry, next slide. What what we try to do, or or what what uh, what uh, we do to to achieve our mission is 
um, to uh, perform applied research and technological development to help companies, entities, entrepreneurs, or whoever reach uh, their um, objectives in terms of, of uh, new technology and, and new processes, new products. So we provide also advanced technological services, but also to reach the, the, the objectives stated, we, we also have uh, a, a technology consultancy department. We also provide a specialized training and we also uh, try to create uh, value from from uh, the existing uh, technologies and, and and finally we as we are doing right now we try to disseminate this knowledge created uh, by the promotion of workshops act um, conferences and attending to uh, events etc so um, we work with the with the companies from the diagnosis to the support uh, in the management of change uh, derived from from the development of, of new products and, and and new technologies so um, the idea is that uh, we help uh, them in the whole process from the the technological development, which is, is is at our core, but also from all those supporting activities required to uh, make uh, what uh, we uh, imagine a reality uh, from the for, for the for the society. So uh, we are um, structuring in four main divisions. One is devoted to to industry. And we are mainly focused on materials, but also in robotics, in textiles, in chemical technology, and innovation and product development. The other one is the digital division, which is uh, focused on, on IT technologies, uh, big data, artificial intelligence, IoT, e-health, cybersecurity, multimedia, etc. We have a, a department focused on, on via technology especially on, on nutrition and, and health and also uh, on, on applying uh, omic sciences for uh, the other uh, divisions. And finally, where Gaetan and myself uh, belong, we have a sustainability division focused on, on improving the overall sustainability of the society and, and more precisely on water, air and soil, waste, energy, batteries, and environmental impact uh, lines of uh, research. Our, uh, our differential value is to combine all these uh, expertises or all these technologies to face, uh, you know, in order to provide solutions in, for, for complex uh, challenges. That, that's our main uh, differential, uh, differential uh, value. And uh, in our in our department, in the water, air, and soil technology unit, we try to improve the sustainability of of the management strategies of water, air, and soil, and the associated resources, mainly um, to achieve the sustainable development goals. So uh, not only to provide more profit to the companies, but also uh, taking into account the environment. And, uh, and the society. So making it in an environmental and, and, and social uh, oriented uh, way. We work uh, in, in, in water, we work in developing technology for improving water management associated resources. We work in advanced separation, biological treatment, advanced oxidation, electrochemical and disinfection processes. We try to identify and evaluate opportunities for efficiency improvement and circular economy implementation. We develop processes for removing trace or recalcitrant compounds and also treating complex effluents. We try to identify and develop process for cascade recirculation and reuse in the industrial processes. We recover water and liquid effluent uh, resources, not only uh, water, but also nutrients, energy, raw materials, uh, etc. And we also provide tools for uh, quality monitoring, prediction and assurance in the in the water distribution networks. 
We tried to study, model, and simulate the behavior and mobility of pollutants in soil and groundwater. We develop and optimize technologies for in situ and ex situ treatment uh, of polluted soil and groundwater. We, we develop processes for uh, based on bioremediation, nanoparticles, monitor natural attenuation, permeable active, uh, reactive barriers, etc. And we try to recover waste or byproducts to improve the physicochemical properties of, of the soil. And finally, we uh, also provide tools for uh, air pollution uh, monitoring in urban, industrial, and, and natural environments. We, we have uh, tools to model and simulate the, the behavior of those pollutants uh, in, 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 in the air. We also try to develop and optimize technology and processes for treating industrial emissions. We uh, are also starting to work in with indoor air quality, which is uh, a hot topic right now. And uh, we, we, we also try to recover and recycle value added gases and, and develop technology for carbon capture, use and, and storage. We, we our approach is, is uh, we have a, a set of tools that help us bring the ideas to the real systems, but uh, we also can work uh, uh, with, with pilot plans and directly with, with, a, with a full scale system. We, our approach is incremental, so we try to use modeling and simulation tools before going to the bench scale. Uh, and after that, we we work at, at pilot scale and and finally at uh, with with uh, full scale systems. Our technology core is based on advanced separation technologies, for example, forward osmosis, but also oxidation technologies, biotechnologies, and also uh, modeling and simulation tools and risk assessment uh, tools too. So this is this is us. Uh, thank you again, uh, Gaetan, and thank you very much, all of you, for attending this this uh, workshop. I remind at your disposal for any further inquiry you may you may have, and I hope that that uh, you all have a, a nice uh, workshop. Thanks, Xavi. Uh, for the presentation of Ricat, I will now just uh, quickly like make a very short introduction of um, of what is forward osmosis for those who are not familiar with this. Um, so basically, forward osmosis relies uh, the idea to show you what is forward osmosis is that later on it will not be repeated by all the, the speakers and just wanted to, to have an introduction on that topic so that the non-experts could uh, could understand what this technology is, is all about. And basically forward osmosis is a membrane technology and it, which is making use of the salinity gradient, the osmotic energy in between two streams. So we always talk about a feed solution and a draw solution. The feed solution is the, um, the low concentration uh, solution, which has the lowest osmotic uh, pressure, and the draw solution has a higher, much higher, ideally, osmotic pressure. And thanks to this uh, different os osmotic pressure, if you put a membrane in between, which is a semi-permeable membrane, basically, um, more or less, uh, all compounds are rejected except water. And uh, what happens is that the water is migrated from is migrating from the lower energy solution, the feed solution, towards the draw solution. And this advantage could be used for two purposes: to first to extract and to purify some water from the feed solution, or to concentrate the feed solution. And this occurs, at least this part, at low or no energy cost because it, it occurs naturally. And this is one of the interests of, of forward osmosis in comparison with uh, other membrane technology, for example. And basically, you can have, you can use those, um, 
benefit of forward osmosis for various applications, which could be water reuse, desalination, fertigation, if you want to extract and purify some water. Uh, there is also a technology called pressure retarded osmosis, which is transforming the, the energy produced by osmotic energy, the osmotic difference, into energy. And also there is more and more, I think, interest to concentrate the feed solution, uh, to concentrate wastewater, brines, to go towards zero liquid discharge, to concentrate liquid food, uh, even for bioprocesses. Uh, if you, you, lo you look at it, um, you have on one side the, in forward osmosis the, the dilute stream, the, the, the feed solution that will be concentrated and the draw solution, which could be uh, seawater or sodium chloride, um, glucose, depending on the application and many other ones, uh, that will extract the water and get diluted. Basically, then this diluted, the one, one question is what to do with this diluted draw solution. So one option is to reconcentrate it, which we, we call the draw recovery processes, where you can also extract water for recovery. So basically, this is a bit one of the limit of the of the forward osmosis at the moment is that well, it requires in general, depending on the application, there are some where it might not be required, but um, an, a reconcentration extraction process, which is the draw recovery process, which could be energy intensive. Um, there is some need for all, as always, I would say, improvement in, in, in membrane, even though um, the last generation of commercial membranes have, have made uh, a quite a huge steps uh, in terms of separation efficiency and water flux, but also at the module scale, and also, well, to validate economics for new applications. Um, there are already several uh, modules and configuration that are available on the market uh, based on all of fiber modules uh, of flat sheet membranes, but um, there might be also some potential improvement, especially for, for challenging streams. So this is a bit uh, where we are. Of course, we can we discuss all that later. And um, now we'll move with already a bit of delay. Uh, towards the, the, um, the first session, which is uh, dedicated to industrial return of experience. The first presentation uh, will be made by Professor Suwan Kim from Pyongyang University, and it's about one, I think it's the largest uh, pilot that uh, has been implemented so far in Korea. It's, it's within the called F4HC project. Uh, then uh, Dr. Cornelissen from KWR, also professor at, at Ghent University, will 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 uh, give us uh, uh, some insights of a few projects he, he worked on on the osmotic processes. We will have uh, another presentation uh, regarding uh, anaerobic centrate concentration by forward osmosis by Dr. Sinagolami from Odialab, and uh, ultimately. Uh, Dr. Lucas Bardella from Maricat will uh, present um, some pilot uh, tests we did on uh, landfill leachate concentration. So the first speaker is Professor Suwan Kim. Um, Professor Kim uh, got uh, vaccinated yesterday and he didn't feel well. So unfortunately, he will not be able to, to present uh, in person, but he sent us a video uh, about the project, and um, I will now launch the, his presentation. So, Marina, if you could uh, share your screen and launch the video. Thank you. Did you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. I am Su Han Kim working at Pugyeong National University, South Korea. If you watch this movie clip, it means that I do not feel very well due to vaccination yesterday and is not able to attend this webinar real time. Sorry about that and please wish me luck.
My topic for this webinar is a four arrow hybrid system for seawater desalination, especially estimation of carbon dioxide emission. Before starting, let's see where Busan is. Busan is located in the southeastern part of South Korea. This is a night view of Busan, very nice. My research interests include membrane-based water process, including pore osmosis. Please find me at Google Scholar like this page. Introduction. Everyone knows that seawater desalination is one of good solutions for water shortage problem, but it requires high energy consumption compared to other water treatment processes. High energy consumption means high carbon emission as well. Global warming is one of the main reasons of water shortage. Desalination is a solution for water shortage, but it needs high energy consumption, which induces carbon emission. This is kind of infinite loop. Can it cut this loop? I want to say, yes, we can, but we should try at least by decreasing energy requirement of desalination. I believe that one of promising approaches to decrease energy consumption of desalination is to introduce fold osmosis in front of reverse osmosis process. Osmotic dilution by fold osmosis result in the less required energy for reverse osmosis for civil desalination, as you can see from this figure. And treated wastewater is reused, reused to decrease energy consumption. My research team took part in FORO hybrid desalination research center for five years. Shorim Industries, one of the participants in the project, constructed 1,000 cubic meter per day pilot system and operated it for several months. Our role, I mean, my research team's role was suggestion of the hybrid system design and expectation of energy consumption. So, I'm sorry. Carbon emission decreases by the decrease in energy consumption thanks to to the introduction of fold osmosis, but carbon emission increases by FO system construction. So our question after the end of the project is, does CO2 emission increase or decrease by introduction of FO? Therefore, our objective in this work is to compare carbon emission from FORO hybrid process with that from SWRO. Uh, in order to achieve this objective, we need to design SWRO and FRO process and estimate carbon emission by construction and energy consumption methods. SWRO process design was carried out using the auto projection software provided by membrane manufacturers. And FO auto process design is carried out by the FO model model recently developed by our research group. In the model, water flux, reverse water flux and reverse salt flux are predicted from the flow rate, pressure, and concentration of input flow, which is draw solution and feed solution. They are used to, I mean, they, 
They means uh, water flux and uh, solute flux. They are used to calculate the flow, pressure, and concentration of output flow, which is diluted through solution and concentrate. As you can see from this figure, the model prediction well matches the experimental flux. Experiment flux. The details about developing the model is in the paper published in 2018 in Desalination. The F4 projection program was developed using the F4 model model. If input data were given for a membrane module, output data were produced by the F4 model model and transferred to the next model, next model, next model connected in series. The Apple projection program was verified using experimental data of Apple system with three Apple modules connected in series. The ex experiment was carried out using the one module system from this figure and three individual experiments were done. The output of one experiment became the input of the next experiment. These are the input conditions of the first experiment. Results and discussion. This graph shows draw solution and feed solution pressure according to the position in the flow process with three modules connected in series. Both pressures decreases as DSN FS flows through the channel inside the module and the modeling data fit the experimental data very well. This graph shows DSN FS flow rate. Because of fold osmosis phenomena, DS flow rate increases and FS flow rate decreases as both flows progress. As you can see, model data fit experimental data very well too. This graph shows salt concentration. Because of fold osmosis, DS concentration decreases by dilution and FS concentration increases by concentrating factor as both flow progress. Model data fits experimental data very well too. These results means the verification of our project, projection program. This is the result of SWRO process design to produce thousand cubic, thousand cubic meter per day of fresh water production from 2,000 cubic meter per day of seawater. The projection was carried out by ROSA, reverse osmosis system analysis from Dow Chemical. This is the result of FORO process system designed to produce the same amount of fresh water. Draw solution is seawater and field solution is a simulated wastewater treatment effluent. Seawater is diluted by FO process and the salt concentration is decreased to 20,000 milligram per liter before entering reverse osmosis. So the required pressure is decreased to 43 atm compared to 62 ATM in the case of SWRO, which results in the decreased energy consumption of the FRO process. Energy consumptions for all pumps used in SWRO and 
FORO processes are calculated using this equation, including pressure, flow rate, and efficiency of pumps. The sum of the calculated energy consumption is converted. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the sum of the calculated energy consumption like this is converted to carbon emission according to the pure time as listed in this figure. From a recent literature, the carbon emission of SWRO system can be broken down into intake of for pretreatment, auto process, and others. In case of in the case of FORO, it has one more category, FO process. Because we don't have any reference of the carbon emission of FO process itself, we assumed the carbon emission of FO process is the same as out of process with the same number of membrane modules. As a result, FO out of process discharges 30%, about 30% more CO2 than SWR out of process. This table shows the summary of carbon emission from SWRO and FRO process. The number of modules is obtained from the process design as explained earlier, and the carbon emission by construction was calculated based on the capacity and the number of modules. Carbon emission by operation depends on the type of energy source, like this table. This figure shows carbon emission by both construction and operation of SWRO and FO processes according to the energy sources. The left side is SWRO and the right side is FORO hybrid system. If energy source is coal, oil, <coughs> and natural gas, the introduction of FO is beneficent in terms of carbon emission. However, if energy source is renewable energy or nuclear, it had better not introduce a flow, although the decreased energy consumption. Summary. In summary, a four-hour hybrid process is investigated compared to SWR process in terms of carbon emission. It is found that carbon emission from a four-hour process is less than the dead of SWRO in case of coal, oil, and natural gas as energy source. When renewable or nuclear energy are used, addition of F4 is not suggested in terms of carbon emission, despite of decreased energy consumption. If you have any questions, please feel free to send me email at this address. And thank you for your kind attention. Well, thanks for this first presentation. Um, so you, as uh, Professor Kim said, you can send him some um, um, some question if you want it. Also, we have uh, here present uh, Jun Seok Choi, uh, who is now uh, at the moment also in, in Eurekat and in, who was involved in this project. So if you have some questions for him, you can send some question via the chat. Uh, now the next presenter is Emil Cornelissen. And Emil, I will let you uh, present now. If you can share your screen. Thanks. Perfect. Everything works? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Always checking. Wait a minute. Let me get a screen 
so I can look you in the eye. All righty, OK, good um, morning, good evening. Um, everybody, uh, thanks for attending this presentation. Thanks, uh, Gaetan, for uh, inviting uh, uh, me uh, for this uh, workshop. It's very exciting. It's nice to uh, uh, be at least digitally together uh, today, uh, the FO community in Europe and, and beyond. Uh, the title of my presentation is Osmotic Processes for uh, Purification, Concentration and Dilution. And when setting up this presentation, I realized that 15 minutes is not a lot. So I'm, uh, I'm afraid that the, uh, the bulk of the presentation is uh, on uh, purification and concentration and dilution. I'll keep that for the discussion. So what I would like to do is give you a short, uh, let's say, uh, trip back uh, on uh, our work on forward osmosis at uh, KWR, also at the University of Ghent. And I also am a guest uh, a researcher at the, the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. But this work is predominantly uh, executed at uh, KWR. So it's a little bit uh, uh, the, the past and, and, uh, and the present. So it started for us with the osmotic membrane bioreactor, which we uh, we had a patent on in 2005. Uh, maybe some of you might know the uh, osmotic membrane bioreactor, and I think uh, Gaetan is uh, still working on that, and we have a presentation of him uh, uh, at the end of this uh, session. Looking forward to that. Uh, but the basic idea is uh, combining uh, wastewater treatment with an osmotic process like FO. Uh, at the right hand side, you see the schematic overview. You either submerge the membranes or you do it in a side stream reactor in which FO modules are the barrier for activated sludge and other uh, solutes present in the wastewater matrix. And uh, the um, diluted draw solution, which we used was uh, sodium chloride, is um, uh, reconcentrated using a reverse osmosis loop. So we have the famous FORO loop. So at first, uh, well, first we had to sell this project and we uh, thought of some advantages of uh, this system. Uh, on the FO side, we have uh, definitely an energy saving uh, component. As Gaetan also explained, it's got a high rejection, especially if you combine it with conventional activated sludge, uh, a reactor in which you have sedimentation or you have a membrane bioreactor, which uh, microfiltration or ultrafiltration uh, membranes are used, which are basically much more open than a full osmosis membrane. And it was postulated that uh, we have lower fouling in the FO part. There were also advantages on the RO part because uh, we offer uh, on the RO part a cleaner solute, a more concentrated salty solute, but cleaner with respect to the other components. So in fact, we have a double barrier and I'll come to that later, but because that was a little bit of a misconception at the start, uh, lower fouling again, and we don't have a concentrate. Well, this is also a little bit of a mystery, of course, and uh, okay, we'll come to that uh, perhaps later as well. Uh, first, this uh, patent is um, written in 2005. We started our research, we interested a Dutch a drinking water company, Waternet, and a Singaporean uh, drinking water company, a public utility board, PUB. So this uh, uh, research was conducted in parallel in the period 2005 to 2010, both in the Netherlands and in Singapore. And, and with this, we were one or even maybe the first one to do this research uh, in the world. So this was pretty exciting and we had many research questions to solve because, well, we had to look at the flux and rejection, uh, depending which type and concentration of draw solutions should we use. Is temperature got an effect, yes, and, and which type of membrane should we use and which orientation uh, can we use. At that stage, there were not so many FO membranes available as today. And we foresaw also a couple of uh, potential problems which are known in the FO community, uh, uh, which is predominantly internal concentration polarization, uh, membrane fouling, of course, despite the uh, advantages uh, uh, mentioned in the previous slide, and salt leakage. So the we first uh, um, uh, transport of salts from the draw solutions towards the feed side, so ending up in the bioreactor. I cannot possibly give you all the details of our outcome, 
but one of the uh, uh, major uh, publications of, of this work uh, is, is uh, given in, uh, in, in JMS uh, in 2008. Nice to see because we started small and the publication I mentioned was only done on this very crude and basic lab scale units, which is a YouTube kind of uh, experiment, very basic, but we uh, quickly uh, scaled up to pilot scale uh, in which we uh, used a flat sheet uh, membrane. I'm not sure you can see my uh, mouse indicator, uh, but here you see a flat sheet uh, in the middle picture. And uh, at the end, we had uh, one of the first ones to have a spiral wound uh, module uh, operating uh, uh, on site. And this was our pilot installation used uh, in the Netherlands. This, this work was uh, published in 2007. 2011, if you can see. So very briefly, uh, one of the outcomes of the um, uh, pilot research in Amsterdam, in the Meer uh, site, uh, we did obtain for a couple of weeks, only very short. Um, as you can see, we didn't have a lot of data points. Uh, the right hand side, you see a picture of the installation and you see clearly here the flat sheet. Uh, and the activated sludge you see some bubbles. We used uh, uh, air water cleaning to, keep, uh, 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 to mitigate uh, uh, spacer fouling, uh, and we achieved these, uh, these flux values. Um, uh, and, and we also investigated the effect of the orientation of the FO uh, membrane. Um, in parallel, in Singapore, we did uh, um, also experiments on, on activated sludge, and you see here a picture of the installation uh, uh, under construction. There is no membrane in, in here, but in, uh, leave me a little bit later on this picture. Uh, then this picture was taken, the spiral wound module was installed, and uh, um, uh, together with uh, Ching Yang uh, Chin from the POB, uh, uh, we performed there some experiments and, and we achieved slightly lower fluxes. We investigated forward uh, uh, flush with air, without air, uh, two different module uh, uh, orientations. And, and, and one of the outcomes is uh, like, like uh, the, the, the flux decline, the lower flux that we uh, measured. Uh, it's only uh, 5 LMH. Uh, I believe it was half uh, a molar of sodium chloride at that stage. I didn't mention that. Um, yeah, it could not be mitigated very uh, um, aggressively using these techniques. So external polarization was definitely uh, uh, much lower than internal concentration polarization. Okay, this is also published in uh, uh, Water Science Technology in 2010. Uh, in the end, uh, we had to defend our case, of course, and we compared, uh, just uh, like the previous speaker, uh, the case between the state of the art being uh, an, a normal MBR uh, using photofiltration uh, membranes, followed by RO with the OMBR, uh, RO, FO, RO loop. Uh, we assumed some, some standard figures um, like, like the cost for membranes, the cost for chemicals, man hours. Uh, we excluded disposal costs and we postulated uh, the prices of FO membrane prices at that stage, what was not even relevant, that was already too, too cheap, what we assumed, and for different uh, achievable FO fluxes. Uh, well, in the end, we concluded this was uh, at, at that stage, 2010, a no-go, uh, to go forward with the OMBR project and, 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 and build this uh, system uh, full scale. It was also, of course, an incredibly ambitious goal, uh, but unfortunately, we didn't make it. Fluxes were too low. Uh, uh, in, in total, the, uh, the energy consumption was too high. And both the uh, Public Utility Board in Singapore and Waternet in uh, Amsterdam, Amsterdam um, concluded that, well, the system needs a little bit more investigation before we can implement it uh, in, uh, in reality. And, and look where we are now. We're still uh, doing some research on this. But a nice outcome of this that it spinned off a different concept. So instead of using uh, the activated sludge, we thought, why not directly uh, contact the forward osmosis membranes uh, with the raw waste? And this was the start of the sewer mining concepts. Uh, and it started 
uh, when the oral osmotic membrane bioreactor project ended in 2010 until 2014. And at that stage was a novel concept for reuse of water and energy. The idea was if we could concentrate uh, the wastewater, uh, it would be a, a, a more beneficial stream to be treated by anaerobic digestion, generating energy, which could be used to offset the energy demand of the RO system in the FORO loop, which was always, let, let's say, killing uh, the, the project, the RO, uh, uh, the energy demand of the RO will always be uh, higher than, um, uh, than if you treat the stream uh, directly with RO. So we could have said this with this uh, digestion of um, concentrated feed stream. And you see here some elements, you need to pre-treat the water, there's a forward osmosis, you reconcentration, and here four is digestion. Uh, it was a, a, a cluster of, uh, of, of partners. Again, Waternet uh, stepped in this project. Uh, at, at that point, Delta Triqua, HDI, that supplied the membranes. Uh, they changed now hands and names. Uh, also the University of Delft and we had a PhD student performing uh, this uh, uh, th this research, and and this was a PhD work of uh, now Dr. Uh, um, um, Kerusha Lutzmaya, and she was uh, at KWR and at the University of Delft in 2010 to 2014. I don't have the time to go over all the topics she did because she did a lot of work. Uh, uh, on the right hand side, you see a picture of her thesis, uh, and and the main aim of her work was obtaining water and energy from wastewater, it's direct wastewater, under optimized performance and operation, uh, operation stable conditions. So she performed a review on houses, which is quite well sounded. You can see all the references if you're interested in these topics. Uh, she looked, uh, well, we looked at alternative draw, solu uh, draw solutions using Zwitter ionic solutions, uh, which uh, performed quite nicely. Um, gave a higher throughput and a higher um, uh, uh, osmosis um, uh, flux. Uh, there was less internal concentration polarization that explained it, uh, uh, but they are, of course, uh, much more expensive than uh, generic draw solutions like sodium chloride. We also investigated the effect of an additional pressure at the feed uh, site, that is pressure assisted osmosis. And there's also a work that Gek Don did actually uh, in parallel with our research. Uh, uh, Karusha also published that, uh, and we looked at fouling. That work was uh, published with another author. We modeled FORO systems. Uh, so then the previous speaker as well, we did similar work. I have a question for him uh, if you also looked at counterflow kind of FORO systems, but we leave that for the discussions. Um, well, and scaling up our FO to pilot scale, and finally, removal of organic micropollutants. I don't have time to go over all these topics. I just want to show you some work. Fouling is an important issue when working with uh, wastewater, of course. And uh, well, here we see already the impact of fouling. The, the, the grayer one, gray one is the baseline, while the black one is the fouled, uh, uh, is the, the, the FO flux uh, with um, Wastewater, you see a um, serious decline, even in a couple of days. Uh, we made some analysis of the fouling. There were some scales. So we saw biopolymers, DFM, you saw roughness increase. Uh, I don't have much time to go into that, but I give you a brief overview of, of what, uh, what we did. We built also a larger pilot, which you can see on the right hand side, quite an exciting pilot. My time is up almost. Sorry, someone. Uh, you have, uh, we, sorry, it's fine. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. Uh, I thought, uh, um, at uh, the right hand side, this was the pilot installation uh, that we constructed. Uh, that was constructed at KWR, and, and, and two months ago, we transported it to the University of Ghent um, to do some research over there. Uh, we have four uh, FO uh, membrane elements, four eight-inch uh, elements, and they were um, connected uh, in series, at least as far as the feed solution goes, and the draw solution was uh, low uh, in, in the draw solution channel in parallels, so it's a little bit of a cross kind of um, a mix of, 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 um, of, of uh, flow transport through these elements. You can see here an element in 
co-current, here in countercurrent, co-current, and countercurrent um, um, flow. Um, okay, for the rest, it's just a, a relatively normal installation. Everything is recirculated over the feed solution and the uh, and, and the uh, draws. There was also a system RO here, uh, so we have here basically an FO RO loop system. Picture you can see here the RO element. It's only basically a four inch uh, RO element, which is inverted. It is hard to see on the picture. Of course, you see here clearly the four. Uh, elements. And what we did, we dosed organic micropollutants in uh, this loop. Uh, well, in the feed solution, and it ended up in the loop, actually. Uh, this is the mixture of organic micropollutants that we dosed. Uh, I, I will not go over the whole list, of course, but you see there is a spread in molecular weight, around 200, 400 uh, grams per mole. Uh, there is a difference in polarity, as indicated by uh, log D charge, negatively neutral and positively charged compounds. And uh, we were looking at the uh, rejection of, um, of either uh, sodium chloride, we used two different uh, draw solutions, and magnesium uh, chloride. Uh, this work is actually this year published, it took us a long time to write this down due to time constraints and different uh, reasons. But uh, uh, finally, uh, Arnold de Haase from the University of Ghent, together with uh, me, published it this year in Journal of Membrane Science. And, and uh, without going too much into detail, uh, I, I really can recommend uh, this article to you. It's quite, uh, quite nice work. Um, uh, you have uh, basically an accumulation of these compounds in your, uh, in your uh, loop. And this was the, the nice insight that we uh, obtained here. You can see it uh, also, Arnold modeled this, and you can see here the outcome of only two examples, carbamazepine and lincomycin. Uh, uh, the blue line is the uh, concentration of your this organic micropollutant feed line, and uh, the blue and the red are the relevant uh, concentrations in the FORO loop. So you see a serious kind of um, um, accumulation of these uh, matters in the FORO loop. Now, this is interesting. So this will uh, challenge this, the statement I said in the beginning that FORO is a double barrier. It's not. Anyway, I don't have time to uh, discuss it in detail, maybe during discussions. And I would like to uh, finalize uh, briefly, and I cannot give too much away of this uh, project because the project partners are quite um, uh, strict on that, but uh, a new project started uh, years ago. It's called Core Water uh, Project, uh, or it's for Concentrate, Reuse and Recover. Basically, the system is similar to the sewer mining uh, uh, project. And you can see here the Xene pretreatment for osmosis uh, FORO loop and uh, the concentrated uh, FO uh, uh, concentrate. Feed water, FIFO, is uh, digested, post treatment, and also nutrients recovery. So, basically, similar as the sewer mining concept, as I explained before. And again, we, we started from laboratory, they start a little bit more polished and, and more uh, uh, professionally uh, looking installation than before. And let's say, uh, what was it, 10, 15 years back already, uh, we started, uh, we constructed two quite nice uh, uh, laboratory flats. Uh, scale unit, you see it here, as an ability to use uh, air water cleaning, uh, osmotic backwash, uh, forward flush. So many ways to mitigate fouling because uh, that is one of the major issues of this project. We did some pilot scale with two uh, um, uh, eight inch uh, FO modules, um, and it is uh, and and these are Torre modules, by the way. And uh, finally, the demo installation, uh, we used 36 FO modules, uh, which you can see here, a picture of the uh, of the uh, C container, which is filled to the brim, as you can see. It's hard to move around in this uh, installation, but I can tell you it's a very exciting, uh, exciting uh, installation, quite large. Uh, as I said, I cannot give too many details. Uh, the idea is to concentrate to, to have a polymetric concentration factor of 30, 20 to 30. And uh, 
Well, we're getting close to that. And the more concentrated our feed solution is going to get, the better it is for the digestive process. So that's uh, this 20 to 30 for the amount of concentration factor is really a, li a little bit of a minimum to be achieved to have this, to have the succession possible on, an, on a commercial scale. We, uh, we've found some hurdles, especially uh, looking at Ammonia uh, that passes FO and RO, so we might need to have an additional process in the permeate stream after FO, RO, and uh, fouling mitigation is essential. And we're looking into different kind of options. I uh, yeah. mentioned already air water cleaning, uh, we're also looking at osmotic uh, backwash kind of um, systems. Well, we uh, managed to uh, um, um, upscale our pilot research from pilot skill, uh, the middle picture in the previous slide to two cubes per hour. And uh, yeah, it's all modular in uh, construction. You saw the series, the arrays of uh, eight inch uh, FO modules. And basically the design without giving too much away is uh, like, uh, like this is a stacked mo uh, uh, molecular, uh, modular design in which there are different stages of RO, uh, FO and uh, brackish water RO uh, in the first stage. In the second stage, there is seawater RO. So uh, in this way, we could uh, uh, balance and, and optimize the energy consumption a little bit better. Uh, for the core demo pilot, uh, the, the, the dashed kind of um, uh, part of this schematic is effective. Uh, these two are not implemented uh, yet. And with that, I would like to conclude with some uh, concluding remarks. Uh, you, you, you saw some uh, novel concepts, at least at that time. Uh, and, and uh, now we are working on the core uh, uh, project as a novel concept for reclaiming water from wastewater. Uh, the techno-economical feasibility is still not proven yet after all these years. Uh, better membranes are always interesting. We at, at KWI University, again, we don't develop membranes, so we depend on, 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 on suppliers. Uh, An optimized uh, draw solution uh, recovery concept is always welcome. Uh, I, I just showed what we did in core. Uh, Improved FO performance is either developing new membranes, but also looking at alternative uh, draw solutions. Well, the pressure assisted osmosis kind of uh, uh, track is interesting, but we feel there's a need for more rigid membranes. And uh, yeah, this is an, an, an still ongoing wish in, in, in our community to get a long term on site FO piloting and also get to publish that uh, uh, that work. Uh, that well, I, I see. Lately, that is getting uh, more and more out there. So this will uh, bring FO work closer to, to, uh, to scale. Some things to look at is the accumulation of uh, solutes. In our case, we saw that for, or, uh, for organic micropollutants in the draw solution loop and uh, fouling control is absolutely essential. With that, I really uh, like to conclude. Thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to uh, the discussion later. Thanks, very interesting. Uh, well, it was a nice. Could you turn off your mic because it makes some echo? Yeah, thank you. Um, no, very interesting to see all the work from the kind of pioneer work up to the large scale pilot testing and some really interesting application for wastewater concentration. Uh, already quite some question on the chat, so we will, uh, you will um, may have to to answer some of those later on. Uh, for now, I will uh, pass um, the presentation to uh, Sina Golami from Audio Lab in Barcelona, who will explain us a uh, concentration scale up of anaerobic centrate through FO. Sina. If you can take the control. Hello. Do you hear me, Kaitan? Yes, perfect. Okay. We see your screen now. Okay, now you see the PowerPoint. Yeah, perfect. Floor is yours. Vale. Hello, everybody. I am Sina Golami from Odil Lab Company. 
uh, Other Lab Company is a company that's most of the works uh, in this company is around forward osmosis filtration. Those are membrane preparation or membrane processes and different methods uh, for wastewater treatment through different types of filtration. A few months ago, we were working on anaerobic centrate concentration in the northern part of Spain, Galicia. The project has been designed for industrial scale filtration through forward osmosis process. It was thought provoking for one of our clients that how we simulate a forward, a forward osmosis process on industrial scale when there is not any specific software on the market for carrying out that simulation. Then we represent the process in which we apply forward osmosis mathematical equation related, related to FO processes in order to have a specific simulator. In order to carry out of this type of scaling up or simulation, predominantly there are two types of parameters. First group, those parameters are providing by membrane supplier, which are salt rejection and water flux that are not in the intrinsic parameter of the membrane. The second group, the second group of parameter include A, which is water permeability, B, salt passage, S, effective thickness, and sigma, reflection coefficient. These part of parameter are intrinsic parameter of the membrane that cannot be changed with varying the con operational condition of the process. Yes, exactly. Here we might cross a question. What is the difference between A and B in second group of the uh, parameters and water flux and salt rejection? Those are providing by the membrane supplier. As I mentioned, as I just mentioned, the A and B parameters, intrinsic parameters, cannot be changed during the uh, operational, uh, different operational condition, but water flux and salt rejection depends on operational condition of the process. That's why, that's why uh, we should figure out those parameters through lab experimental works, the parameters, intrinsic, intrinsic parameters of the membrane, we should figure out them through lab experimental works and apply them on the relative mathematical equation. The first mathematical model or equation can provide the parameter of A and the second equation, which is more complicated, provides the parameter of B. In order to work on this equation, we need to measure internal and external concentration polarization. Through the related equations, we can provide amount of internal and external concentration polarization and replace those obtained amount in the JS formula in order to figure out the parameter of B. Maybe here, briefly, we can illustrate external concentration polarization that we can call it ECP and also internal concentration polarization ICP. ECP. Please consider to a scheme of forward osmosis. As Guyton at the beginning of the webinar mentioned, during the process, water would pass through the membrane and other components that we can assume them as a salt here, will be rejected by the TFC layer. By passing time during the process, salt accumulate near to TFC layer, layer. Salt accumulate near to TFC layer and the concentration of this point will be increased. So, in actually by passing time during the process, we will have the phenomenon of external concentration polarization. The common way for decreasing and removing this phenomenon is diminish and decreasing the concentration of this point. Now, please consider to the formula. As you can see, for decreasing of this parameter, we need to increase 
parameter of mass transfer coefficient. And for increasing this parameter, the, the common way normally all of us during the process we perform is increasing tangential velocity of feed fluid. So in the end, we could diminish the external concentration polarization by a modification on process property and operational condition. In other side, we have internal concentration polarization is more obstacle problem for forward osmosis membrane. Please consider to the a scheme of the forward osmosis. There are two points. The first point is, is signifying the concentration of uh, that part of the membrane that is more close, is closer to the draw solution side. And another point that uh, signify, is signifying concentration of the uh, of that point that is more near to TFC, but in this case is inside of the membrane, inside of the ultra filtration support layer. If you want to, okay. If I if I wanna I wanna explain uh, briefly what is going on there, we can see during the process with throwing and passing the water uh, from TFC layer to inside of the. Uh, ultra filtration layer and also soft passage from other side of the forward osmosis membrane, we will have soft dilution and decreasing the um, decreasing the salt concentration during the ultra filtration membrane. This is a problem, real problem in forward osmosis membrane. How we can diminish this problem that called internal concentration polarization? Obviously, we can increase, we should increase concentration of the, this point, that the, the parameter showing with C index D power to W. As we have more concentration on this, this point, we will have more uh, uh, osmotic pressure difference between two sides of the membrane and resulting in better performance. Now, please throw back to the formula. This is the specific formula for ICP. For increasing this par increasing of this parameter, we should increase mass transfer coefficient. How we can increase mass transfer coefficient? Consider to next proportion. For increasing mass transfer coefficient, we should increase effective thickness. For increasing effective thickness, next proportion, we should we should have a specific ultra filtration membrane that has thinner thickness T, lower tortosity, and higher porosity. Therefore, we could have lower amount of internal concentration polarization through membrane modification. All those uh, concentration polarization in forward osmosis membrane have been illustrated by true mathematical equation. In the end, we could find all four parameters of intrinsic uh, group of those parameters, which should obtain them. And about the sigma, if I go back to the another slide, normally parameter of sigma, that is a reflection coefficient, is related to salt rejection property of the membrane. Most of the time, all membranes we are using actually uh, have higher concentration, salt rejection, higher than 95%. When this is the amount of salt rejection, we can assume uh, amount of sigma uh, that is equal with 0.99 and replace it in the formula. So now we could, we could achieve parameter of A, parameter of B, parameter of sigma, uh, that this achievement is throwing experimental work with a small piece of uh, those membrane we want to apply in pilot plant and in scaling up. And in the end, and in the end, with applying these parameters, this amount of these parameters and uh, using them in a equa uh, mathematical equation, we are able to coding and writing a specific simulator for uh, our purpose. Here you can see the scheme of our pilot plan that is provided in Galicia, that is built in Galicia, 
and also two scheme of uh, simulators. Uh, one minute later, I'm going to work with our, our simulator, but by the moment, I can, I can tell you the simulators that we provided, we have provided, there are two types of, about simulators, there are two types of simulator. The first simulator that is included with a section of recovery that carried out by reverse osmosis process, uh, we can change the amount of self rejection that is upon property of reverse osmosis membrane. Also, we can change intrinsic parameter of A and B in the bottom of the simulator that are intrinsic parameter of the membrane, but we cannot change the surface area of the membrane because this is the constant part of simulator. Also, the fit tanks volume and some uh, parameter else that they are, these, those are constant in the simulator cannot be changed, but other inputs is possible to change. And in another side, you can see another type of simulator that we uh, actually we provided. There are more inputs to inputs to change and to achieve results that we we can we can achieve during the experimental work or during work with simulator. For example, there are some parameters for changing the uh, draw solution molarity and also fit flow molarity. Also, we can change the power of the pump. And one interest, in interest, interesting part is the uh, those parts that we can change the condition of valves, different uh, valves that we are applying in the system, and we can see effect of them in different parts of the mem uh, the, the pilot plant. So before finishing the presentation, I'm going to work with one of the simulators. My screen is shared, Gaitan? Uh, yes, it's still your so, former presentation. So now, is it appear, the simulator? No. No? Maybe you did uh, share the, you share only your presentation. Maybe you have to. Uh, let me check. No, I don't know. Sheena, but I think the uh, way... screen should be. Sheena, the, the best way is to, to go out from the, the screen and enter again the screen. Choosing the the, um, the program of your simulator, you will see in your in your program in your screen. Yes. Stop sharing and share again. The okay, let's do stop sharing. Okay, here, yes. Do you see the simulator? Yeah. OK, this is the first mode of simulator. Here we can change the self rejection property of reverse osmosis. Uh, reverse osmosis membrane. That is related to recovery section. Also, we can change the operation time for the process and more important parameters are water permeability coefficient and salt permeability coefficient that those are A and B parameters, intrinsic parameters that we obtained during the experimental work in the lab. Also, they can be changed and you can see how goes different the result of all works. The red curve is related to reverse osmosis and the blue parts are related to forward osmosis section of the process. If I start to play, you can see how they can be changed with different points that we applied. Okay, it was the first mode.
So now you wanted to show us another. Yeah, simulation? I'm going, okay. I don't know. Are you are you are you able to see the second simulator or not? No, and right now you st stop sharing. Okay, but again, again, again open. If you can go quickly because we are running late and uh, yeah, we, it will be time to move to the next presentation. For sure, but uh, there is some technical problem, I think. Anyway. One, one, one more try, then I give up. <laughs> okay, now I think you can see. Yes? Yes. Okay. No, it disappeared again. Yeah, this is the second mood of our simulator. There are it, some parameters. It, 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 disappeared. it disappeared from the screen. You, you, you're not sharing anymore. Now? Yes. OK. This is second mode of our simulator that we can change the molarity of its solution. We can change the molarity of the raw solution. Also, the, and also we can see how it affects different condition of the valve and different part of the system about the flow, about the pressure. And also, we can change the power of the pump. This simulator could help us too much, actually. Uh, decrease the experimental works that we could we, we should uh, make in, in industrial grade and pilot plant and a very effective economic uh, parameter. Uh, in the end, I, okay, maybe I go here. In the end, I would like to say uh, I would like to thanks Gaitan for making this opportunity for all of us. And thank you so much for attention the audience. And if you have any question, I am here available. And also through the email, I could answer all of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sina, for sharing your, your work on the, on the development of this uh, nice simulator. I guess it's quite, uh, could be quite useful for process design. Um, yeah. I will pass the floor to Luca, uh, which is a colleague here at uh, RECAT, and um, which will present the, the, the test we've done uh, within the EFLUCOM project on the concentration by forward osmosis of landfill leachate. Luca, floor is yours. Thanks, Gaetan. Let's see. So good morning to everyone and thanks for being here. Thanks Gaetan for giving us this opportunity to attend this, this seminar. I'm gonna present some of the results we have obtained and seen the context of the EFLUCOM project, focusing on landfill leachate concentration through FO. So landfill is the, still one of the most used uh, method to deal with uh, urban solid waste. And no matter the quality of the landfill, there is landfill leachate, which is produced and infiltrates uh, through the degrading wastes. So this matrix, landfill leachate, is a really complex mixture of organic and inorganic compounds and with a high concentration of organic pollutants, toxic materials, ammonia, heavy metals, inorganic cells, and depending on the characteristic of the sites, even uh, other kind of com contaminants can be uh, present there. So it needs to be uh, treated and dealt with. So the proposed solution we have been uh, working uh, in, this, in this project is to use uh, forward osmosis to concentrate the the landfill the leachate as much as possible and then we, we have uh, we produce so the diluted raw solution which uh, should be recovered in order to send back to the forward fo system and in this case since we are dealing with uh, leachate with a, a electrical conductivity of uh, 35 millisiemens per centimeter 
we cannot go uh, for standard uh, pressure based uh, system because we should apply uh, pressure higher than uh, 80 bars. Sorry. So when we propose to use uh, electrolysis system and so we reach, uh, we can obtain uh, recovered water with, for safe discharge and the concentrated stream is sent back to a full uh, process. So the objective is to obtain a safe discharge of the recovered water and to uh, have a water recovery for the FO system of 17%. The pilot plants we have been uh, operating is composed basically by uh, three tanks, the feed tank, draw solution, and uh, the, the tank for the, for the diluted draw solution. And we have been working with aquaporin module uh, just applying a um, pre-treatment of uh, 50 micrograms filters. What the, the different trials we have been performing in order to characterize the, uh, the, the possibility to, to concentrate the, the leachate uh, were uh, summarized in this table. Basically, we uh, studied the effect of draw solution reconcentration, the effect of uh, applying different flow rates, and then we mm, operate the system to concentrate the leachates at different pH in order to see the results in terms mostly in terms of uh, ammonium rejection. And then we wanted to uh, simulate what would happen, let's say, in real life with uh, single pass operations, so in continuous operation. So when we see uh, the first results we, we obtained uh, uh, with uh, using uh, DI water as feed solution, we wanted to see what happens uh, without reconcentrating the draw solution and with cost and drop uh, solution concentration. So as you can see, there is a significant changes in terms of uh, the trend of the, the flux. Uh, without reconcentration, it decreases a long time while... Um, Sorry, it's not the presentation in the screen. No? Uh, yes, it is. Okay, I can see it too. I can see it perfectly. Then it's my problem. Then sorry, mm -hmm. I did this. Okay, it's my yeah. problem. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, 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 no problem at all. And I don't know if what I can help to what I can do to help you. Uh, anyway, uh, I was saying that there is this uh, in we, when we reconcentrate and we can keep constant the uh, the the conductivity of the draw solution. We have uh, constant flux as well as uh, we can reach our target of 70% water recovery in a shorter time. It takes. Then, after uh, having assessed this uh, previous behavior of the membrane, uh, we wanted to see what would happen if we work with uh, a fit solution with uh, sensibly higher conductivity uh, and in concrete, well, specifically the same conductivity of the leachate we uh, will have to treat uh, in the future. So we operate the system with water as feed, but with 35 millisiemens per centimeter of conductivity. And we can see the same trends uh, uh, the, the, the flux decreases in both cases with, uh, without and with uh, drury concentration, but it's interesting to see the, the, the time we needed to achieve our goal. And more, more, speci more specifically, that uh, if we don't reconcentrate the draw solution, so we keep uh, the, the, the draw solution diluted, we cannot achieve uh, at least in uh, um, feasible time, uh, our goal of 70% uh, water recovery. So uh, for for now on and during the uh, whole set of experiments, we always uh, perform them with, uh, let's say, constant draw solution uh, conductivity. 
Then when we uh, applied the same condition we have uh, uh, we have mm, chosen for uh, mm, to to operate the pilot plant, but uh, using as feed uh, the real length lead shades, which was which had the pH of 8.3, we can see that uh, in this case the 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 flux also. Uh, dropped uh, sensibly after uh, two hours of operation, reaching uh, uh, 3 LMH at the end of experiment, but still after two hours we could uh, reach our, uh, our goal of 70% uh, water recovery. Then uh, looking forward, we, we knew that uh, at this pH we could have um, experienced some problem with some uh, monovalent uh, cations, especially ammonium. So uh, we wanted to perform the experiment also at lower pH. So we did the ne neutralization of the leachate, uh, reaching pH 6.5, and performed the same experiment. And it's interesting to see uh, how the performance of the system changed a bit. Uh, more specifically, we had lower flux, and because of this, also the time needed to reach 70% water recovery was uh, was higher. So one it took one hour more to reach the same the same uh, treatment goal. This could all this the could be due to the fact that uh, with the neutralization we changed the a little bit the composition of the leachate at the beginning of the experiment and indeed also the electrical conductivity uh, of the leachates during the experiment at 6.5 was higher. So this could, uh, mm, this, this, this results in longer uh, treatment time. But then, okay, it can be a longer treatment time, but let's see in terms of water uh, quality, if the different, P, the application of different pH could uh, could give us uh, better results or not. So in this graph, we can see the recovery in the concentrated uh, leachate of the most relevant uh, compounds. And we can see that it's very interesting, the, uh, the, the quality, we, um, the rejection, uh, the, sorry, the recovery we obtained uh, for most of the compounds was uh, between 70 and 100%. Uh, so very high uh, recovery. So this means that uh, they didn't pass through the, the membrane and we, we, we won't find them in the draw solution. But it's also uh, what, what, what we have expected, what we were expecting about uh, uh, monovalent cations, uh, mostly potassium and uh, ammonium, it, it became a reality. So we had that these two uh, cations uh, pass through the, the membrane. And so you can see that they are, they are characterized by the, uh, the, the lowest uh, uh, recovery. In particular, uh, as it has expressed and reported in literature, what happens with ammonium is that uh, uh, it, it has been reported that it pass, it can pass uh, quite easily through uh, thin film composite membranes because of the radius and because it's similar to uh, the water molecule and the polarity as well. So we perform a mass balance uh, of ammonium uh, during uh, both experiments in order to check uh, um, what, what, what happened with this compound. So uh, what we saw is that uh, in uh, both cases, at both, uh, both pH values, we had uh, around, of, around 35 percent of ammonium was lost. And what was changed, changing is the, the mechanism of losing the ammonium. So in, due to the calculation uh, made in, with the mass balance, we saw that the, uh, the losses through membrane passage uh, were uh, more important when there, there were there were more losses in the pH 8.3, but because of stripping. 
and uh, as we were expecting, lowering the pH, neutralizing the uh, the, the feed solution, we had uh, lower stripping uh, phenomena. But as we saw previously, at pH 6.5, the uh, it took uh, it takes uh, longer operating time to reach the treatment goal. So at the end. If we have, if you look at global picture, the operating system and lower pH could reduce the, the stripping of ammonia, but the overall loss losses uh, could be higher. So um, we tried this uh, the solution to um, to tackle the this ammonia issue, but uh, so far to, to what we have seen. Lowering the pH uh, couldn't 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 be the uh, preferred solution to to face this problem. It's uh, it's also important, as we uh, saw in previous uh, slides and previous presentation, to uh, assess the falling uh, of the of the membrane module. So what we've done is that after uh, each experiment, sorry, there is some noise. After each experiment, we uh, make a cleaning, let's say a falling control test, and we compare the the flux tendency with the the flux obtained with clean module. So as you can see, we in this graph. The, the the flux uh, evolution throughout time didn't show significant differences uh, between the clean module and uh, after each test. Actually, you can see that the clean module was characterized by slightly lower flux values, but this is maybe because the, the new mo module uh, needed some pre-treatment, pre some pre-compactation procedure in order to reach its design uh, flux. So the, from this graph, we can uh, conclude that no significant uh, uh, loss of flux was observed. And with our application, uh, 50 micrometers per filtration could be enough to ensure correct operation, even though, as we saw in previous presentation, to us really assess falling and other problems less, such as scaling, we need long-term uh, assessments. So as I, as I said before, one of the preview, one of the last uh, um, uh, experiments we performed was to assess uh, whether this uh, system could, uh, could be uh, changed to, um, to single pass continuous operation. So in this case, we operate. We didn't recirculate the the feed, and we applied a con, uh, feed flow rate, and we test the effect of decreasing feed flow rate in order to see at which flow rate we could we could achieve the 70% water recovery. So and we saw that the decreasing the flow rate uh, till reach till the value of 93 uh, liters per hour we could achieve in one pass the 70% water recovery we wanted. So it's very interesting to assess this kind of uh, a performance because the, this result suggests that even though we keep the flow rate of the design value of the module, which was 400 liters per hour, we can, uh, we can achieve the, our targets well, our treatment targets simply by placing in series several uh, modules. And since the ammonium was the main, uh, let's say, uh, technical and quality uh, problem we got uh, in our uh, experience, uh, we wanted to check uh, what was the results in terms of ammonium rejection in this single pass. And we see that with only one pass, we could we uh, observed uh, lower mm, uh, losses of, ammon of ammonium passing through the membrane, suggesting that what we obtain, what the, the, the high loss of ammonium we obtained at the previous experiments, they were, they were because of 
they batch operating mode. So each time the feed passes to the membrane, there is a, a, an aliquot, a percentage of ammonia passing to the membrane. So the more you recirculate, the more you uh, the the, um, the more there is the ammonia that you you lose. So very briefly, because I'm uh, heading to conclusion. Uh, the the idea is we need to regenerate the draw solution in order to keep the system working in continuous mode, and so we propose in the con context of this project the electrodialysis, and it's very interesting to know that with this system we could achieve two streams. So we had a diluted stream uh, with uh, with um, and conductivity of six millisiemens per centimeter, so it, it was uh, filling the discharge limit yeah, of, of in, in our context. And then the concentrated stream uh, was sent back to the initial conductivity of uh, uh, well, up to uh, 100 millisiemens per centimeter. So we can use this system to uh, continuously regenerate the draw solution and keep the system uh, working uh, coupled with the F4. And the electrical consumption of this system well, was sensibly higher than the, the one the F4, ranging between uh, 7 7.5 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. So what we proposed was F4 coupled with uh, electrolysis to treat the landfill lead shades. What, what, was, what, what can be the take-home message as well? That's the target goal of 70% uh, uh, was possible with F4. We didn't observe fouling or clogging or scaling, but we still need long-term uh, experiments. The, for this kind of uh, solution and to, to treat uh, high salinity uh, feed, we need high salinity draw solution and uh, actually higher than uh, one, 100 millisiemens per centimeter. F4 allowed for higher high contaminant rejection, except for uh, monovalent mono cations, and we especially for ammonium. And yes, we did observe that ammonium was lost through membrane passage and because of stripping as well. Although continuous operation uh, would limit the losses of ammonium, and on top of that, can obtain higher efficiency to the possibility to operate in uh, counter current mode. We also saw that uh, electrodialysis application uh, obtained a draw solution reconcentration as we wanted to the same to the level we wanted, and at the same time fulfill water dis discharge limits. Finally, summing the sum of the electrical co energy consumption of uh, electrodialysis and FO, uh, FO was below uh, eight kilowatt hours per cubic meter. So I acknowledge um, Axio for the uh, funding of these projects, and thanks to you for your kind attention. Thanks, Luca. Um, very interesting presentation. Um, I'm moving quickly because we are running late and we have uh, quite some questions for the first presenter. Uh, I will start with the first one from WhatsApp, which is a bit generic about how do we recover the draw solution in the in the real plant? Uh, maybe I can answer that one. Of course, it depends on the type of draw solution, but uh, we saw the first example where uh, FO was combined with RO, so RO could be an option, or it could be also, in this case, discharged as a, as a brine. Um, Luca just presenting the coupling FO with uh, electrodialysis as another option. It all depends on the type of draw solution and the conductivity. Um, so it, it, it's only it's really really depending on the system and uh, and uh, and the requirements. Then we have a question from German Fanianas to Emil. Um, what is the estimated uh, salinity content of the concentrated waste uh, water to feed the anaerobic digester? And are there some kind of uh, limitations of presence of uh, some ions that can dis disturb the digested quality, impact the, the process, the digestion? Yeah. 
that's a, an interesting question. Thanks. Uh, yeah, the, the, the TDS the wastewater treatment plant is just a generic kind of uh, uh, wastewater treatment composition is around, what is it, 500 milligrams per litre. I don't know that fluctuation, but in, in that line. So we aim to concentrate at 20 to 30 times uh, the concentration factor. So depending on the rejection of this, 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 this single uh, ions in the solution, you end up also with a TDS of, of, of a quite high, a couple of grams per liter, up to 10 grams per liter. We did actually some, um, some digestion uh, experiments. And yeah, depending if you start with, with, uh, uh, with the biomass, that, that could be some inhibition. Uh, but if you, uh, what we, we saw in due time, <clears throat> There's some adjustment, and and we didn't see a serious hampering of of, of our digestion kind of uh, capacity. Although it was not uh, the research I did myself, but uh, this is the report I read from my uh, from my from my colleagues. Uh, also, the COD levels will concentrate like 200, uh, 20, sorry, 20 to 30 times. So we'll end up with uh, COD levels of between five to 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 10 grams per liter. So that will seriously uh, boost the digestion. So there are two counterbalancing kind of uh, effects. But it, it's an interesting question. The final answer is, is, is I, I didn't give yet, but uh, so far, uh, not really a problem. OK, thanks. Uh, and you have another question from uh, Luca regarding yeah. more the fouling, cleaning uh, strategy. Um, yeah. The, yeah. What, what, what is your global experience uh, on that aspect? Yeah. I, I coupled it also with the question of, of Wolfgang in, in, uh, in this, because the, the, the whole philosophy uh, of, of, the, um, of operating this plant, yeah, fouling control. How can you do fouling control? Either by uh, extensive pretreatment, uh, by putting maybe an ultrafiltration in front of it or, or an extensive kind of line. And we had a lot of discussions in this project, but the, the, the pretreatment is expensive and, and uh, every kind of suggestion we put forward was really burned down because of, of, of uh, economical feasibility of the whole system. So uh, we have a minimal, a minimal pretreatment and we operate now with drum filters of 40 uh, micrometers. That's all. So uh, we have to ensure the integrity of the filters uh, not to get the whole system get uh, uh, clogged by particles. Uh, but for the rest, it's just the raw effluent with, without a lot of uh, pretreatment. Uh, uh, effluent, I mean influent, of course. Um, so the whole fouling control is done by curative kind of approaches. And 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 the question is, uh, what do you do? We do it all. We have uh, we have air water cleaning uh, daily, daily air water cleaning, coupled with an osmotic backwash, uh, and then also. Uh, and a chemical cleaning every couple of days. So it's 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 highly intensive uh, um, um, cleaning approach that we uh, we try to uh, to get. So minimal pretreatment, maximal uh, maximum kind of um, curative approaches. Uh, yeah, it, it is it is a real challenge. I can tell you. I cannot well, give away too much, but it's a headache. It's only really your challenge to. To, to put a raw wastewater facing a membrane. So it's already some kind of achievement to to show that it's feasible, no? Yeah, yeah. If it's if technically, it, it seems to be feasible. Well, we deal now with quite low uh, fluxes, as you can see from the presentation of Dr. Luca as well. The higher you go in concentration factor, of course, the, 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 the FO flux will drop and that will compromise the economic feasibility. So economic Economic feasibility is 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 not that yet there. So, uh, but technically, yeah, we have, yeah, it's running. Okay, thanks. Um, we have a question from Pierre Leclerc regarding the large pilot uh, uh, FO. Unfortunately, uh, also we have a question from Emil to Professor Kim, but he's not uh, present. Um, maybe we can ask June, uh, my colleague from Ericat, because he was involved in this uh, large project from uh, FOHC. I don't know, uh, June, if you have the authorization <laughs> to speak uh, with the chat. Maybe we should give you the... Yes, you can. Um, 
Yeah, well, um, June, do you know what is the next step regarding the FOHC pilot and uh, industrialization of the system? And also the other question is, um, did you do some work on modeling co-current flow or uh, counter-current flow? Yeah, um, I don't know if I can give on uh, a correct answer. Uh, I think Professor Kim would also have a considered uh, current current model. But in my opinion, since the model made by Professor Kim based on Torre module, so co-current is more effective than current current. So I think uh, when we uh, consider the module length, so. Um, I think Professor Kim also can be more detailed uh, answer after uh, this uh, uh, webinar. And second answer is, uh, it also depends on the purpose and the site in uh, adaptation in April. So for example, uh, to scale up to uh, FOR pilot plan in the uh, real field uh, size. So we have to find the, uh, the end user and we have to find the optimal place to adapt this system. So we have to consider that purpose. That is my opinion. Okay. And the other question regarding the, um, the future of the FOHC pilot on I mean what is the next step regarding commercialization or how do you have any idea on that? Full scale implementation of the technology that has been developed in this project? June? No. <laughs> No, well, so I think the, the best way will be to, to send an email to, to Professor Kim to have a view on that. Um, we also have a question from Wata regarding the, the, the modeling, uh, which is what some modeling that we use also in the FOHC program, program, program but also uh, Sina, uh, mentioned this. Um, I had a question regarding this aspect also for, for the lab. Um, the model you are developing is also regarding this co-current, counter-current aspect. How, how does it work at the module scale or, or is it considered in, 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 the, in the model? Sina, I don't know if you have Or someone from our lab. No. Sorry, Gaetan. Uh, I'm more for our lab, but I I cannot. Uh, fortunately, I cannot respond. I um I will email you the answer, please, because okay. uh, Sina is not here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we also had a comment from Soham Meta regarding the long-term operation flux for continuous, op continuous operation in a high falling application and the CIP method. Well, I guess uh, at least from the Flucom project, we did only short time test. I don't know uh, about the core project uh, for how long it has been running, but th that's definitely one of the challenge for uh, long time um, operation, I guess. And uh, Emil, I think, already partly answered uh, about their strategy, but there's definitely some more work to do. Uh, there is also a question for, from Emil to Luca about the water uh, concentration factor, which was, in, uh, was limited to 70%. Um, why could you not increase this? Uh, Luca, you want to answer? Uh, 
sorry, I didn't see this question, otherwise I would have answered in the chat. And yeah, basically it was mainly due to the limitation of uh, the draw solution we had to apply. So, because yeah, starting from at the end of the experiment, the feed solution, uh, concentrated feed solution was reaching uh, 90, 95 millisiemens per centimeter of electrical conductivity. So going uh, further would have been very difficult in, from a technical point of view in order to have uh, sensibly higher conductivity in the draw solution and afterwards as consequence uh, problem to recover the to regenerate the draw solution as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. I think this is one of the limitation of this uh, highly concentrated stream that you need a uh, draw solution with very high concentration and the more you want to concentrate them and the uh, higher you go into the draw solution concentration and you have to adapt the draw recovery solution which gets very expensive. Yeah. And the reason for using EDR there is this was the there was this uh, question also to Luca from uh, Salud. Okay, I just answered to this in the chat, but anyway, yes, because uh, the, the main reason was uh, linked to what I've just said. So the, the diluted draw solution has a conductivity of around 80 millisiemens per centimeter. So conventional membrane braced um, system could not be applied. Uh, should they, they should have been applied to um, pressure higher than 80 bars, so actually so far there are very few, it's very, there are very um, few technical solutions to do that and so far very expensive, so it is the, the main, actually the, the, main, the main reason. And also because, yeah, the, we can obtain the diluted stream uh, from the ADR, which was uh, fulfilling the discharge for brine sewers here in Catalonia, so which was the limit of six millisiemens per centimeter. So this technology could allow to uh, deal with uh, the, the diluted draw solution and to achieve also the discharge limits. Perfect, thanks. Well, uh, I would like to thank all the presenters from the first session. Uh, we're running a bit late, but um, so I will move quickly to the second session. Um, let me share my screen to introduce the next uh, speakers. So, um, So this is the second session now, which will be more uh, focused on fundamental aspects and new approaches, uh, more lab scale study, let's say. And the first presenter is uh, Jan Froholtz from uh, Aquaporin, which will uh, talk about transport mechanism um, in forward osmosis and reverse osmosis. Then Esther Mendoza from ICRA will present uh, project on fertilizer drone for osmosis for clay water reuse. And then Sergi Pinardel will talk a bit on uh, implementing FO before uh, concentrating uh, uh, municipal sewage, like uh, a bit in, in similar configuration than uh, what uh, Emil mentioned before. And uh, we'll be the closing the, the, the session with uh, uh, showing you a bit of the project I'm working on, uh, working on for two years. And then we will have uh, another Q&A session on the table that will be shortened depending on the uh, 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 What are you like? Um,
And uh, now I will uh, uh, let uh, Jan uh, show his work. Jan, uh, you can share your, your screen. Perfect, thanks. thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, sh short note in the beginning, I had some network issues when I was listening to, to you, to the presentation before. If you cannot hear me properly, just let me know, then I will switch off the, the video, but I hope it, it works also like that. Oh, no, it's perfect. Cool. Right. All right. We see a black screen for now. Yeah, for me, uh, the, the screen is frozen at the moment. I uh, don't know if you can hear me. Um, yes, we can hear you, but uh, we just see you. Ah, uh, maybe you. now something has changed. Can, can you see my screen now? Yeah. Perfect. Um, just the pointer here. Yeah, perfect. Thanks uh, for the invitation uh, and the introduction. My name is Jan Frauholz. I'm an industrial PhD student at Equaporan, and I would like to present our recent study on transport mechanisms behind enhanced solar rejection and forward osmosis um, compared to reverse osmosis mode. And as uh, many of you might know, there are certain uh, different advantages for forward osmosis if we compare it to pressure driven uh, processes such as reverse osmosis. Uh, and one of them which is uh, reoccurring reported is that uh, forward osmosis has a higher feed solid rejection than, than pressure driven uh, membrane processes. Um, we were trying to, to, to figure the out what, what are the reasons behind it. But, but if you want to compare both processes, you, you have some challenges there. The first thing is that, that normally different membranes are used. As, as you know, reverse osmosis membranes have thicker support layers. Um, for, for, for FO, we need a um, thin uh, support layer for the draw solute to diffuse to the active, active layer. And as well, um, it's not always possible to keep the, the operation conditions uh, comparable uh, in both processes. What we were doing is um, we tried to keep everything as comparable as possible. We used the same hollow fiber membrane module. It's a uh, forward osmosis uh, membrane module, um, hollow fiber based with 2.3 square meter membrane area. Um, it's, it's the Equiporin HFFO2 module, and we used that one originally and the second version, which, which we chlorinated in order to enhance the flux of water, but also to lower the rejection with, with the hope that we see differences in rejection more clear uh, with, with the chlorinated membrane. So we were using exactly the same membrane for reverse osmosis and, and, and forward osmosis. We applied uh, or, or we used a water recovery of 50%. The water flux was 10 LMH for, for all experiments. And the feed solution in our case here was DI water spiked with tracers. To reach those 10 LMH of, of water flux, we adjusted uh, in forward osmosis the, the draw flow rate of half a molar sodium chloride solution. In low pressure reverse osmosis, we, we adjust the TMP to, to um, get exactly those 10 LMH to, to keep it comparable. The feed marker rejection, which, which we were investigating, were nicotinamide and caffeine, both 40 milligrams per liter. And, and we've chosen those two organics because they are uncharged, and we try to avoid any interaction between marker and membrane charge to, to um, do not have too many effects which could influence our, our rejection here. The setup is now displayed on, on, on the right side. 
um, basically quite simple. The, the feed solution is, is flowing inside the, the fibers on the lumen side. Um, it's, it's the active layer side of, of this membrane, so it's, it's an inside coated hollow fiber modules, and the permeate is withdrawn from, from the shell side of the module. For forward osmosis, of course, we were applying a draw solution, which, which was flowing uh, counter currently through, through this, this module. The rejection calculation calculation was done in a bit different way than you might be used to um, from from low pressure or from from reverse osmosis where you often use the concentration of your feed marker in your feed and in your permeate um, we were using a simple mass balance so we were looking how much tracer how much mass of tracer is entering with the feed and how much is permeating or diffusing through the membrane and we can find uh, which mass can we find in the draw out or for lpro in the permeate by using this kind of, of calculation both processes um, are better comparable because um, in the end um, it's a mass balance which is independent on water flux or draw flow rate which would uh, with an increase in draw flow rate you would otherwise dilute your um, your marker concentration in on, on the draw side. So if we look into the, the results which are now displayed on, on the right side, we have the results for caffeine and nicotinamides. Those, those uh, columns here are showing the rejection and you find always the FO and the reverse osmosis or low pressure reverse osmosis results on, on the rejection. And then we had those two types of membranes, the chlorinated one, which is here indicated with a C, and the original one, which is, which is indicated with, with the O. And if, if, if we look at those rejection data, then first of all, we see caffeine is better rejected uh, than, than nicotine uh, amide. That's, that's quite logical because the molecular weight is also bigger. So the bigger compound is rejected better in both uh, processes. Furthermore, you see that, that the chlorinated membranes have a lower rejection than, than the original one. That's basically what we were aiming for when, when we chlorinated uh, the, the membranes. So now the interesting part, if we compare forward osmosis and reverse osmosis, then we will find for, for, for all membranes and both markers, we will find a higher rejection in forward osmosis compared to low pressure reverse osmosis. For example, the chlorinated membrane rejected nicotinamide in forward osmosis with 85.5%. In reverse osmosis, we only got 69.6% uh, uh, of rejection. This difference becomes even a bit more clear if we do not look at rejection, but at solid passage. So, so in the end, it's one minus rejection. And here we see that um, nicotinamide with the chlorinated is, uh, is only passing, 15% of it is only passing the membrane in reverse osmosis two times as much. And for the original membrane, we even have a factor three between uh, forward osmosis and reverse osmosis here. We were now interested in, in the reason behind why, why do we see those significant differences between reverse osmosis and forward osmosis, although we're using the same membrane. And, and then we were thinking about both processes and, and the differences. And, and basically in, in um, reverse osmosis, you have applied hydraulic pressure, which is missing in forward osmosis. And in forward osmosis, you have uh, the, the presence of ions from your draw solution, which is missing in, in reverse osmosis. So the first thing we were investigating here was the influence of, of pressure. Um, what is plotted here is basically low pressure reverse osmosis results. The columns here are, are the water flux. For us now, more interesting is the rejection data um, plotted by um, those, those data points here. And, and what we see basically is um, especially for nicotinamide, for caffeine, it's, it's all membranes were rejecting quite high, but, but for nicotinamide, um, what we might see here is a small difference between five and, and seven bar, but compared to the difference to, to forward osmosis, that, that difference here is, is, is quite small. So, so the next step was that we were applying a transmembrane pressure in um, forward osmosis from zero to two bar transmembrane pressure, pressure by pressurizing the, the lumen side, the feed side um, uh, of, of the membrane. And what we see here again is that, that the rejection maybe is, is slightly changing, but overall it's more or less pressure independent, I would say. 
Um, especially if you compare those rejections here for, 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 for the chlorinated, which is around 85% in FO, for, for um, low pressure reverse osmosis, we have 15 percentage below. So, so pressure was kind of excluded. Maybe there is a minimum uh, effect of pressure on the rejection, but for us, it does not seem to be the explanation for, for this enhanced rejection in, in forward osmosis. The next investigation um, and test was um, to see which, which influence do we find of the draw solutes. And, and what we were doing there is, uh, uh, basically, we increase the draw flow rate, um, and if you increase the draw flow rate, of course, the draw is, is passing faster through your module and it gets uh, less diluted, so, so your average uh, draw concentration is increased in, in your module. And, and logically, your water flux here, the black dots on, on the left side, is increasing, um, and, and the salt flux is increasing as well, since, since um, you, you have a bigger um, concent concentration gradient in, in salt due, due to the increased average draw concentration. If, if we then look at, at the forward osmosis uh, rejection results for those different um, draw flow rates, then we see basically um, that, that the rejection increases as well with an increase in draw flow rate. Um, what is what is quite interesting here is that that the first uh, so so those star shaped data points are the results from low pressure reverse osmosis and what we see here is that as soon as we apply a draw solution we get a get a quite a big jump quite big increase in rejection and later on it does not increase that that much anymore it, it it's still increasing but but not as much as as the 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 first step here so um, what, what we can conclude here, the one thing is um, that uh, uh, basically the, the applying a draw solution is contributing a lot to, to this enhanced uh, forward rejection in our tests. If, if we look now at the profile, um, we see that JS is developing um, quite linear. Um, if we look at the, the, the rejection profile, it does not increase linear. So a second conclusion we, we could draw here is basically that um, the rejection does not increase linearly with the salt flux. Mm, so in, in the end, um, we, we figured out that, that for, for our, our tests and, and our uh, tracers, the, the effect of the ions is basically contributing to, to this enhanced rejection. And if we look a bit theoretically um, on uh, both processes, then we have reverse osmosis with, with water flux from the left to the right and a solid flux, feed solid flux as well. In forward osmosis, it's basically the same situation. Um, we have the solid flux, feed solid flux and the water flux. And additionally, we have this, um, these ions uh, present in, in the draw solution on one side of the membrane. So we get, of course, this additional flux, the reverse solid flux. If, if we now consider um, how can we explain the difference of feed solid flux, then um, in the end, any flux across a membrane depends on, on the driving force. The bigger the driving force is, um, the, the bigger our flux will be for any component. And the second thing is, is the resistance, what, what we see here. So looking at the resistance, um, we, we used the same membrane and we didn't see any big influence of pressure. So we exclude kind of uh, any big effect of, of compaction of the membrane, which could change the membrane resistance. So um, our idea here is that uh, the, the counter-directed diffusion of, of the reverse solute flux counter-directed to, um, to the feed solute uh, transport could uh, cause a steric hindrance between each other. This could either be in the support layer or in the active layer. And, and that's if, if you look into literature, this is one of the, the um, most written explanation for, for this enhanced uh, uh, FO rejection and, and often re referred to as uh, retarded forward diffusion. The second idea we had is a bit based on, on the driving force. If we look at diffusion uh, through the active layer, then the flux of any component follows a uh, fixed law, which is basically um, the diffusion coefficient times the, the driving force here, the gradient in, in, in chemical potential. And our idea here was that um, the ions on the on the draw side might elevate the chemical potential of our feed marker on on the on the draw side, 
and thereby decreasing the the driving force for for the for the feed solo to to diffuse. So um, this effect is basically well known from from salting out effects where where certain organics, if you have them in an aqueous solution, um, and you add certain salts to this solution, you can decrease the solubility of the organic in the aqueous phase. And 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 the, the reason behind it is is exactly the same that that the chemical potential of the organic is elevated by by the addition of salt. Um, and we assume that uh, this could be an additional effect which which is taking place here and uh, contributing to the uh, enhanced forward rejection of forward osmosis. To um, summarize a bit, uh, we we have seen a higher rejection of nicotinamide and caffeine in forward osmosis uh, compared to low pressure reverse osmosis. Pressure seemed not to be the crucial factor. Um, and, and we concluded that the presence of salt in the draw solution um, is, is the reason behind this, this significant, significant differences in, in rejection. And, and two theories uh, we, we propose here, the one is the sterical hindrance in the support and active layer of counter diffusing ions and feed solid flux. And the, the second idea we had is the elevation of, of uh, feed markers chemical potential um, by, by, by the ions uh, in the draw solution, which, which are basically lowering the, the driving force. Um, if you are interested in this topic, uh, we, we have just recently published a paper with the same title as this uh, presentation in, in the Journal of Membrane Science. So um, um, there you can find more information and, and background and uh, more, more tests about uh, the whole topic. Yes, um, thanks for, for listening. Thanks for now and uh, I'm, I'm happy to take your questions later. Thanks, Jan. A very interesting, more fundamental uh, work and presentation. Um, well, uh, for those who have questions, please use the chat and uh, Jan will uh, answer later on. I will now uh, pass the comment to Esther from uh, ICRA. Esther, if you can share your screen. Can you see it? Yes, perfect. OK. So hello, everybody, and thank you for the invitation of this session. I'm Esther, and today I will present you the, my experiments with fertilized ground for osmosis, aiming at sustainable gray water reuse in, in the Mediterranean region. Okay, so why are we focused on uh, tourism and uh, in the Mediterranean? Well, because it's a very important activity in the Mediterranean economy. And also we are in a water scarce area. So with the increased coming of, of tourists, uh, we are expecting more pressure on the water resources. So we have to reuse the water in order to be able to cope with uh, all this touristic activity. So how can we reuse the water in touristic accommodations? Well, uh, a very nice idea is to think about the vast amount of uh, showers that we have in the hotels, for example, and actually people shower more when they are on holiday. So we have a lot of water from there. And this water that has lower solids and is less polluted than, uh, let's say, regular wastewater, can be treated within the touristic accommodations and uh, can be applied into hydroponic systems. Why hydroponic systems? Well, because they can be installed anywhere uh, in the hotels, either inside or outside of the establishments. And then we can have edibles over there, so then we have a more circular approach in, where, in which we reuse the grey water to grow edibles and then we can eat the edibles that we are growing in, in our hotel. So within this framework, the, the aim of the, um, of the project in Turing, which I'm doing my thesis, is to develop knowledge and integrate sustainable solutions 
in order to ensure safe green water reuse within touristic cities. Now, uh, what uh, I've been uh, trying, what I've been working with, is with fertilizer drawn forward osmosis. So the aim of my experiments was uh, to achieve a proper draw dilution. In uh, my case, I'm working with a concentrated uh, fertilizer solution, which is uh, which contains potassium nitrate and ammonium phosphate, which are very common fertilizers that will give the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, potassium for the plants, which are the main nutrients. So this, this solution will be diluted with the gray water coming from the showers. Uh, the aim of uh, the experiment was uh, twofold. Let's say the first of all uh, was to, to prove that we can achieve the optimal uh, draw dilution in order to get the concentration of the of the nutrients for hydroponic systems within one step. This is something that has never been reported and uh, authors working with this technology always point out the need of substantial dilution of the final draw solution in order to have an efficient process. So I, here you see the, the ranges that we were aiming to because every plant and in every stage of growth, uh, they need a different nutrient requirement. So as we wanted to test it as a proof of concept, we were aiming to reach these concentrations. And then uh, we also wanted to, to see what was the ion behavior. So we were analyzing the, the ion fluxes, which will be translated in nutrient losses if we have uh, ion fluxes from the draw side to the feed side. And also uh, we wanted to test the influence of feed salts in the process because uh, some people say that it influence positive or negative or it doesn't have any kind of influence, so we wanted to address that. And we wanted to study all of this in uh, osmotic equilibrium conditions. I am working with an aquaporin hollow fiber uh, module uh, of 2.3 square meters. And uh, my my target was to dilute the draw solution 50, 15 times. So I was starting with 60 liters of feed solution and the draw dilution will extract the 30 liters of this feed solution. In order to study ion behavior and uh, osmotic equilibrium, I was evaluating the conductivity in the feed and, uh, and draw site. And when the ratio in between these, uh, these two conductivities was lower than, than 0 0.2, so there, were, there was a less than the 20% of difference between the two conductivities, we assumed that we have reached osmotic equilibrium. Also, we were analyzing the, the ions with ion chromatography, and uh, I was checking the, the balance. Of the, of the different charts. So I was dividing the, the sum of uh, cations in the, between the sum of anions to see whether the, the ions were passing in order to balance charts and in, in molar ratios. In order to address uh, these two main objectives, I was, I was having two different set of tests. So the first one was having uh, the ionized water in the feed side and different concentrations of the two fertilizers in the draw side. Then uh, in another set of tests, uh, I was trying the same concentration of the two fertilizers in the draw side as in the first condition here. And then I was testing different salts in the feed side. These salts are typically found in waste water or gray water or salt water, which are commonly, which are good candidates for feed solutions. And also they have a combination of, uh, there are a combination of monovalent and divalent ions. Here you see the results of the first test. First, uh, tests. So um, this is the concentration of the nutrients in the draw solution at the end of the tests for nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. And this is, these are the targeted ranges. Uh, as you can see, for some of the mixes, we reached the proper concentrations for some of the nutrients. And just with one of the mix, with mix five, we reached the proper concentration for the three nutrients. 
So this solution could be directly applied with into hydroponic systems and the plants will grow, will be happy, will survive. Here you see other parameters. So we read the targeted mass dilution that was 15 times. And then uh, here you see the, the ratio between the conductivities. Uh, none of them uh, are close to 100%, which means that osmotic equilibrium wasn't achieved and more water could have been extracted. Here you see that the, the charges, like the molar um, equilibrium, was uh, happening in all the solutions and also along the experiment. So we proved that, that this is possible. Then here you have the results with uh, those tests with salts in, uh, in the feed side. And as you can see, with the same figures, we read uh, proper concentrations for nitrogen and potassium with uh, magnesium chloride. But uh, the phosphorus, it's way over the targeted concentration and actually way over the level of toxicity for the plants. So we couldn't implement this, uh, this solution into hydroponic systems because the plants will die out of phosphorus uh, toxicity. Let's see what uh, happens in these uh, tests. Well, first of all, we didn't have uh, the targeted ma mass dilution, although it was different with the different salts. So we see that the salts have some influence on the process and also the type of salt influence. What is going to happen at the end? Then we see that uh, we had osmotic equilibrium prior to the targeted uh, draw dilution. So that's why we couldn't extract the elites that we were aiming to because osmotic equilibrium happened. And also here you see that the, well, the, um, the molar ratio was complying in generally in all, in all of the experiments. So going a little deeper to see what's the explanation behind this, here you have the composition at the end of the experiments of each one of the main ions the, for, for the fertilizer solution. So the, the, green, um, the green bar, the green part is the, the content uh, in the feed solution and the, the orange is in the draw solution. So the most ideal scenario will be to have this kind of figure with all of uh, with all of the ions, but it didn't happen. So with the two cations that has have this the same charge and similar size, we have very similar solution, uh, very similar results, and we see that uh, the the losses to the feed are way higher when we have uh, salts present in the feed. That's why we have more green part here. But the behavior is pretty similar for the two uh, for the two cations. When we see the negative charges here, the two anions, uh, the phosphate, which is uh, way bigger and more negatively charged, is not passing through the membrane, almost like nothing. And uh, yeah, that's why we have a lot of phosphate in the in the final uh, draw solution because we didn't reach the targeted uh, dilution. So all of all of the phosphate that we put at the beginning is there at the end. Then on the other hand, we have very big losses of nitrate to the feed side. So like 70%, for example, here of the nitrate is gone to the the feed side. Why this happens? Well, because Nitrate is smaller, and as you saw before, that the the molar ratio is complying with anions and cations. So the nitrate has to cope with uh, this the, the passage of this uh, these two cations. So these are the the results of the of the fertilizers, and then for the salts present in the feed, we also see different behaviors. This is the percentage of passage in this case from the feed side to the draw side. And uh, well, regarding the, the anions, we don't have uh, problems, neither with the magnesium. We just have a little bit of magnesium going to the draw side, which is not bad for the plants, because um, magnesium is a divalent, 
divalent ion, so for it is more difficult to pass through the membrane. But as you can see here, when we are working with sodium, we have uh, some losses, some passage, let's say, of sodium to the to the draw side, 35 and 20 percent, uh, which is related with the counter ion that they have. So the sulfate, because it's bigger, uh, decreases the passage of sodium ions to the draw side. But what is important to, to know from here is that the concentration of sodium in the draw site is higher than the level uh, of toxicity for the plant. So if we used any of uh, the sodium uh, solution for the, for the plants, we will have toxicity for the, pot, uh, for the phosphate that I already told you, and also toxicity for the sodium. So this, this is something that we really have to, to look for. So what can we conclude from, from this? Well, first of all, that we are happy because we proved that uh, there is uh, the, the dilution to reach proper NPK concentration to be applied directly in uh, hydroponics works. So it's possible. We check that the, the ion behavior depends on the chart and also on the site. And in our case, we saw that the, the presence of feed uh, salt uh, has a negative influence on the process. We have reached osmotic equilibrium prior to the targeted dilution, and also we have lost a lot of uh, fertilizer, a, a, a big amount of fertilizer to the feed site, which compromised the feasibility of, uh, of this uh, part of the forward osmosis technology. So we are positive, <laughs> we still believe in it, but we need to do further validation work. So um, I think we, we would need to have more selective membrane, membranes, especially for, um, yeah, focused on monovalent ions. Also, we should work with other system configuration because we see that working at osmotic equilibrium maybe is not the best way. And of course, we need to implement this technology with uh, real grey water or wastewater streams and in bigger uh, scale studies. So that was all. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Esther, for the nice presentation. Um, you were so confused. Jan said before that uh, there are quite some interaction in between feed and draw solutions. Uh, some more work to, to, to do on that aspect as well. Um, you already have a, several questions uh, on the chat. You can have a look at it and you will answer it later on at the end of the session. Now I'll pass uh, to the next presenter, Sergi Vinardel. Sergi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gaetan, for your presentation. Now I will show well one moment. Uh, um, well, okay. Um, Okay, uh, so well, uh, first of all, uh, I think that uh, do you listen to me? Is all correct? It's my screen. Uh, okay. Is uh, yeah. Okay. Great. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Gaetan, for for the opportunity to carry out this presentation in in this webinar. Uh, well, in this presentation, I will show a specific application of forward osmosis, which is uh, to pre-concentrate uh, municipal sewage before an anaerobic membrane by a reactor. Um, well, um, just as a little introduction, um, activated sludge processes are widely used in wastewater treatment plants to treat municipal sewage. Uh, however, activated sludge is, uh, doesn't fit with the current context of climate change and resource depletion. Uh, conversely, uh, anaerobic digestion is an energy harvesting technology uh, where the sewage organic matter can be transformed into uh, methane-rich biogas. Um, anaerobic membrane bioreactor, which is a, a specific application of anaerobic digestion for municipal sewage treatment, uh, is an emerging technology for uh, the treatment of, of, of sewage. 
and which combines in the same bioreactor membrane separation and anaerobic digestion processes. Uh, anaerobic membrane bioreactor allows an excellent decoupling of the HRT from the SRT, uh, high COD removal efficiencies, and achieving uh, high uh, quality effluent free of suspended solids. Uh, however, there are still some limitations um, uh, for the implementation of the for a widespread implementation of an aerobic membrane by a reactor, such as the diluted origin of wastewater. Uh, in this sense, forward osmosis preconcentration is an opportunity to increase the sewage uh, organic matter and reduces the volumetric flow rate. Um, the combination of forward osmosis and NMBR technologies allows reducing bioreactor volume and membrane area for the NMBR, increasing the methane productivity per cubic meter of sewage, and reducing the, the amount of methane lost in the effluent. Therefore, uh, forward osmosis and NMBR combination is an opens new window of opportunity for wastewater treatment plants to shift energy neutrality. Um, uh, moreover, if uh, water, uh, fresh water can be recovered from the diluted drop solution if a drop solution recovery step is applied. Um, well, uh, to integrate forward osmosis, preconcentration, and NMBR technologies, we conceived uh, three different or three possible configurations uh, for that. Um, uh, when natural drop solutions are available, such as seawater, um, open loop schemes are usually preferred. In these schemes, the diluted seawater after the forward osmosis process can be either directly discharged into the sea or be fed to a reverse osmosis process to produce reclaimed water from the diluted seawater. Uh, uh, on the other hand, when uh, natural draw solutions are not available, uh, synthetic draw solution is needed uh, in a closed loop scheme. In the closed loop scheme, the synthetic draw solution uh, is used in a closed scheme, and the reverse osmosis is used to re-establish and to regenerate the, the draw solution to the initial osmotic pressure, to get the initial osmotic pressure to the draw solution to be fed again to the forward osmosis process. Well, uh, for this presentation and to better understand um, the impact of uh, combining forward osmosis and NMBR technologies uh, for municipal sewage treatment. I've defined two main objectives for this uh, presentation, and I will try to give the key points of these of these two, two objectives which are highlighted. The first one is to evaluate the performance of an NMBR treating pre-concentrated municipal sewage by means of a lab scale, and to evaluate the economic feasibility to combine forward osmosis, reverse osmosis, and NMBR by means of a technical economic analysis. Um, well, uh, regarding the LAPA scale NMBR, the NMBR uh, used in the laboratory uh, consisted of a continuous stereo tank reactor coupled to a side stream um, ultrafiltration flat sheet membrane. Uh, the NMBR was fed with a synthetic feeding. The synthetic feeding simulated the uh, forward osmosis concentrate with different preconcentration factors, uh, which corresponded to the different periods applied to the NMBR. Uh, period one was with a preconcentration factor of one, period two with a preconcentration of two, period three of five, and period four of ten, which are, and below you can see the respective. Um, forward osmosis recovery, water recoveries. Uh, in the synthetic feed, it was also included the sodium, sodium chloride uh, because we wanted to evaluate the effect of possible reversal at flux, the impact that could have a higher sodium and chloride concentration on the NMBR performance because part of this sodium chloride would uh, permeate the forward osmosis membrane because of a reversal at flux, which has been already mentioned in the in, in some previous presentations. Um, well, regarding the, the figures, we can see that how the NMBR performance could be performed uh, under uh, treating uh, preconcentrated municipal sewage uh, with a synthetic sewage simulating uh, typical municipal one. Um, in the in the figure um, in the figure above, uh, there are the depicted the organic loading rate and sodium concentrations of the feed for the different operational conditions. And uh, in the figure below, you can see the COD and volatile fatty acids concentration in the NMBR effluent, as well as the COD removal efficiencies of the NMBR. Um, 
well, the results show that uh, the NMBR performance was successfully operated for pre-concentrated municipal sewage with average co removal efficiencies above 90%. Um, some fluctuations were observed during period one and period two, I am period four, sorry. Uh, during period one, it uh, could be attributed this COD removal fluctuations to uh, the ongoing acclimatization of anaerobic biomass to an NMBR conditions. And the ones which occur during period four were, can be mainly attributed to an organic show which occurred on day 65, which increased the organic uh, loading rate to the reactor and um, uh, lead to some fluctuations in the anaerobic biomass performance of the NMBR. However, in both uh, conditions, the NMBR performance was uh, reestablished, uh, which showed the great adaptability of the anaerobic biomass present in the NMBR. Overall, these results would demonstrate that, well, uh, an MBR could be a suitable technology to treat municipal sewage pre-concentrated uh, by forward osmosis with influent concentrations up to 6.5 grams COD liter and sodium concentrations up to uh, 2.3 grams sodium liter. However, besides the experimental uh, performance, it is important to evaluate uh, in, to take into account that forward osmosis uh, process, that the implementation of a forward osmosis process could have a big impact on the economic balance of a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, therefore, uh, we carried out a, an economic analysis to evaluate the impact or the, the feasibility to implement forward osmosis for municipal sewage per concentration and MBR for municipal sewage treatment and reverse osmosis for uh, reclaimed water production. Uh, four different scenarios were considered. The baseline scenario, which was the NMBR without forward osmosis per concentration, and then three scenarios, uh, scenario one, scenario two, and scenario three, which considered the implementation of a forward osmosis reverse osmosis process. Uh, the difference between a scenario one, a scenario two, and a scenario three relied on the different strategies used, um, or the different strategies used in the forward osmosis. In particular, the forward osmosis water recovery. In case of a scenario one, it was considered a recovery of 50 percent, a scenario two recovery of 80 percent, a scenario three recovery of 90 percent. Uh, the, the different scenarios were uh, simulated um, and. Uh, there were and also were considered three different schemes. Uh, scheme A and scheme B were open loop schemes. Uh, the difference between A and B were primarily related to the strategy used in the reverse osmosis stage. In the reverse osmosis stage, it was considered uh, for a scheme A maximization of water production to consider to fix the seawater brine osmotic pressure to 46 bars, which is a typical seawater osmotic pressure in brines of seawater reverse osmosis plants. But in this case, we have the diluted seawater, so the recovery would be higher when maximizing water production than typical seawater reverse osmosis plants. And secondly, the scheme B considered that the reverse osmosis uh, recovery was restricted to 45%, uh, regardless of the osmotic pressure of the diluted seawater. Uh, regarding the scheme C, it was a uh, it was a closed loop scheme using a synthetic drop solution of sodium chloride. Well, um, ah, sorry, uh, just a final uh, remark: uh, the economic incomes that could be obtained from uh, water production and biogas production or electricity production from this biogas were not included in this economic evaluation. Um, okay, regarding the, the, the results, uh, the figure shows the wastewater treatment cost for the different scenarios and schemes evaluated. Uh, in the left, you can see uh, the, the, um, the explanation of each of these scenarios. OL is open loop, TL is closed loop. Uh, well, the results show that um, when implementing a forward osmosis process, the a uh, fraction of an MBR to the total cost is reduced. Uh, is reduced because the volumetric flow rate is decreased to the an MBR. So the volume of the bioreactor and the an MBR is reduced. I and the ball and the and the area of the membrane is reduced. However, when uh, however, in overall, the cost is higher because the cost contribution of forward osmosis and reverse osmosis fraction uh, cannot be offset by the reduction in the an MBR cost. Therefore, the baseline scenario, which doesn't implement an, uh, forward osmosis, is the most competitive scenarios in, comp in comparison to scenario one, two, three. 
although it's also worth mentioning that in these scenarios we didn't contemplate the uh, to include the uh, water production uh, the the revenues that we could achieve from water production that could also uh, improve the competitiveness of uh, options implementing for water osmosis versus osmosis system. Um, regarding the different schemes, the scheme A is the scheme with a bigger uh, cost, with the biggest cost. Uh, this is because, uh, well, scheme A is the one which maximizes the water production and therefore the reverse osmosis stage, also uh, higher larger installation is also required for reverse osmosis and therefore it leads to a higher uh, total cost. Um, importantly, these results show that the higher the forward osmosis recovery, the higher the cost. Uh, this is firmly attributed to the forward osmosis flux, and uh, it also shows that forward osmosis flux is a key parameter governing the implementation of these three technologies. Before we decided to carry out a sensitivity analysis for the forward osmosis flux in function to the wastewater treatment costs, uh, to evaluate the impact of forward osmosis flux on um, on uh, on the economics of integrating forward osmosis versus osmosis and NMBR for municipal sewage treatment. Uh, the results show that the, the wastewater treatment costs sharply decrease as the water, as the forward osmosis water flux decrease from I increase from one LMH to ten LMH. However, uh, from 10 LMH, further improvements in membrane permeability did not lead to substantial decrease of uh, wastewater treatment costs. Um, this, uh, this can be mainly attributed to the fact that as the forward osmosis uh, membrane flux increases, the contribution of forward osmosis costs to the total cost, which also includes reverse osmosis and an NMBR uh, fraction, decreases. Uh, because we need a lower installation for forward osmosis system. Uh, the results also show that um, that achieving that achieving a flux of 10 LMH or above could be a suitable uh, could be suitable to uh, reduce and to improve the competitiveness of the integration of these three technologies. Uh, however, considering uh, low, well, if we consider uh, recoveries, low recoveries such as scenario one with 50% of water flux of 10 LMH is uh, quite achievable. However, when 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 um, when considering higher recoveries, such as a scenario two and a scenario three with recoveries of 80% and 90%, achieving uh, fluxes of 10 LMH in the uh, forward osmosis system still needs uh, further improvements in the technology. Um, well, um, um, well it's, uh, that's all. Just as a final remark, I would like to highlight that uh, the points discussed in this presentation can be found or uh, part of these results can be found in these three uh, publications. Uh, well. Thank you so much for your attention, and I will be happy to, to answer your questions, if any. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Sir. It was a very interesting presentation, and which includes also all the technical economics. So it's also quite interesting. It complements somehow what uh, Emil presented uh, also earlier on, on regarding a uh, uh, large scale pilot. Um, I think I am the last presenter now of this session, so uh, I will now share my screen. Uh, and start the, the last presentation of today. And then we will have like a last uh, question and answer session and a round table um, to, to finish at 12.30 at the latest. So um, I'm going to present the, the, the projects called Survey4, which is, means submerged forward osmosis for water in the circular economy. Uh, basically, that was a um, Techno Spring Plus uh, grant, um, which in this type of grant is uh, oriented toward the technology transfer. Um, I did this uh, this uh, Techno Spring postdoc uh, grant. I, I, I mean, I did because I'm about to finish now. Uh, so it was for the last two years. 
Uh, I did this in the in Uricat, uh, as you know now, uh, a bit more of Uricat, and within the supervision of uh, Xavi Martinez in uh, water, air, and uh, soil unit. And uh, in fact, with this uh, grant, uh, I, the, my 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 um, research was split it in two two times. Ooh, one year, the first year I spent it. Uh, in uh, Montpellier within the um, EOM, which is, stands for uh, Membrane uh, 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 European Membrane Institute, and especially in the Membrane Process Engineering team in Montpellier. Uh, there's a supervision of uh, Marc Heron here. Um, so just to start quickly with what, what, what I mean by submerged forward osmosis, it's like uh, similar to why you can find uh, with submerged uh, ultrafiltration or um, uh, microfiltration membrane in a membrane bioreactor, basically. Uh, the difference in between the, the typical FO system that you can find is that in an FO system, you, usually you have a, a feed loop and a draw loop. Both are circulating through a, a module. And uh, and in the case of uh, submerged forward osmosis, in fact, the, this is a module that is uh, dipped into a feed uh, tank. So only the draw solution is circulating within the module, and the feed the, the feed solution is not circulated. It it, it stays in the tank. The objective of the project basically was to uh, scale up and to move from membrane synthesis up to, let's say, large-scale large pilot uh, validation. So I've been working a bit on a flat sheet membrane, especially uh, synthesis uh, in, um, in uh, Montpellier, in uh, IEM. And I worked especially on the module development, so um, submerged plate and frame mostly, and also uh, did a bit of work on the submerged all fiber modules. And then moved to mass, more like the mass transfer um, uh, studies, and also uh, testing some application where this technology could be implemented. And finally, um, doing some tests with a larger module. So this is the largest module we, we have uh, designed, which is uh, up to one square meter filtration surface area. And this is here, it's connected to the pilot that uh, was presented before by Luca uh, from Protect Nemet and used for this Efflucom project. So this pilot was adapted with submerged uh, plates. So um, just like a bit of uh, say history about uh, this plate and frame module, uh, the first generation um, some years ago, we started by trying to modify some existing uh, membrane uh, microfiltration plate and frame module that typical for MBR from Kubota, which means that if you want to transform this into um, FO plate and frame uh, system, you have to change the type of membrane, uh, remove the, the microfiltration membrane and change it to uh, forward osmosis membrane. You have to change also the spacers and also the circulation of the row because the main difference is in a, in a microfiltration uh, module, for example, you just have a suction and the, the water is pumped out, while in a forward osmosis submerged module, you have to circulate the feed that have to go all through the module and go out. And you have to optimize the circulation of this feed. And um, basically, this was the second generation that we, we did in, in Montpellier as well. So we, we, we worked with uh, PVC uh, modules and already optimized a bit the, the shape and uh, of, of those modules. And then, uh, with the support of the advanced manufacturing system team from Eurecat, which is working uh, mostly on, on 3D printing, we started to design uh, some uh, 3D pr printed modules. So we tried several technology. First, we start with the basic one that you can find in any lab, uh, especially research lab, who think that with 3D printing, they could do everything. And at the end, they see that it's not so easy. 
but basically this this type of uh, PLA filament um, technology uh, is fully porous and you you cannot really uh, make use of uh, that technology to 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 make a module and then we move to slightly more advanced uh, technology jet fusion and uh, resin uh, SLA where in that case we managed to make some uh, some some module that were uh, leak free and um, that we could uh, validate later on uh, on the on a larger scale and the other aspect I've uh, been working on is the the um, CFD. So um, we, we've been trying to uh, optimize the design of this module and the channel, the circulation channel of the of the of the draw solution within the module. Here you you only see like U shape type modules, but uh, you can see that depending on the on the cross flow velocity, you have more or less dead zones that will create some uh, some uh, lower performances in the in the filtration later on. And also, if we compare like a straight uh, straight module to a plate module, uh, you will you can see that um, there is also a difference in terms of repartition of the flow, and also uh, the the higher you go in the in a design of a plate and the higher you have a dilution of the draw solution within your plate and you're also losing a bit of osmotic pressure within the, the plate and frame module. Basically all that was um, because at the beginning when we did the first comparison, uh, comparing like the same membrane, I think in this case it was a Torre membrane, TFC membrane, when we compare the performance of uh, a plate, plate and frame module to the performance you can obtain in the, for the same membrane in a cross flow cell, so more optimized hydrodynamics, there is a huge gap in terms of permeation flux. Here you think like 35 gram per liter, like seawater, you, you, you have a, a ratio of nearly uh, four times. And because of that, um, there were two two aspects uh, we, we, we've seen that were crucial. One was the external concentration polarization. Uh, in fact, what happens if you just uh, dip your uh, membrane module within your feed solution is that they will have a buildup of uh, concentration polarization layer. Uh, and if you you have if you don't <coughs> implement uh, a system with like a recirculation, aeration to provide turbulences, then you will have quite some losses of, uh, of, of permeation flux. And the other aspect was also the module design. So here there are some, some initial design that we've, we've been working on and that were presented where we can already see like with 35 gram per liter, you can already reach like 15, 20, which is much higher than the, the, the initial performance we had. So with this study, we already kind of demonstrate that it was possible to improve significantly the, the, the performance of the initial module. And I think with the last module we've been producing, we are now close to 25, 30. So we are getting close to the, to the performances we could obtain in cross flow cells. Uh, speaking of uh, aeration, uh, impact of aeration on uh, external concentration polarization, basically this is uh, the pilot uh, uh, developed by uh, by uh, the EUM, and where we can have a plate uh, aeration below, eventually recirculation with conductivity, pH, temperature control, and also we have a balance for the draw circulation and to to measure the flow, the the, the flux. And basically, we did uh, quite a lot of tests, in fact. And but especially, what was interesting is was to perform some uh, aeration cycles. So in that case, for example, we did we operated the system with uh, having some on-off cycle of aeration. So you can see, for example, at the beginning during the first 10 minutes that uh, we provide uh, aeration with the uh, here below. And uh, we have a flux uh, around 12 LMH, for example. And once we stop the aeration, I immediately 
there is a decrease of the permeation flux, which means that which is linked to the formation of a layer of concentra uh, external concentration polarization. And this happens in like something like five minutes. And once after 10 minutes, if you restart the aeration immediately, there is an increase of the permeation flux back to its initial level. There's a slight decrease over time. It's just because there is draw dilution uh, during the, the experiment. But other than that, it tells that it comes back to its initial level. And several times like this, you can see that uh, operating on off, immediately you have some effect on the concentration polarization. We can see it also on the on the conductivity in the fit solution, like in in normal operation and the um, and the um, aeration. There is a sort of good mixing, so uh, whatever salt that uh, is getting concentrated because the feed con concentrated and also the salt that pass from the draw to the feed, there is a like a linear increase of the conductivity, and once you stop the aeration, the conductivity remains constant. Uh, this conductivity remains constant. It's just because like the salt is accumulating on the, on the membrane surface, and in that case, it doesn't um, it doesn't increase in the overall feed. So because the the, the additional salt that should uh, come here is uh, is maintained in the is really on the on the membrane surface. And once you start the aeration again after 20 minutes, there is a drop of conductivity, which means that the salt that was kept on the membrane surface suddenly is uh, redispersed in the overall feed solution. So it's all about uh, this um, these, uh, external concentration polarization layer that builds up on the membrane surface in the feed tank. And this is a key issue to be mitigated in the in the submerged system, and actually, what we observed, I don't have all the the results here, but is only a very uh, low amount of uh, air was sufficient to remove this uh, to to break this uh, concentration polariz polarization layer, much below that the, the typical aeration rate you can find in an MBR, for example. And um, then um, I also, we also worked on the impact of aeration on, on, uh, on concentration polarization, but also fouling. So uh, it's a bit like the, the, the figure from the former slide. Uh, in this case, we did some um, experiment with two minutes of aeration and 10 minutes without aeration. In the first, uh, in the first um, test, so it's only DI water in the feed. And again, like, like before, you can see that once you stop the aeration, there is a decrease of the flux uh, that uh, decreases down to some somehow stable value around nine in, in this case. And once you put back the aeration, it goes back to its initial level. So you have this type of... Uh, of uh, cycles and behavior. Uh, as I said before, the decrease here of the flux uh, and the aeration, for example, is just because of the, uh, sorry, the decrease of uh, flux with, the, with time, it's just due to the dilution of the draw solution. So you have like a high level and a low level corresponding to the situation with or without aeration. Sorry. Then uh, we did the same experiment with uh, using bentonite as a model foliant. And what we observe is that um, operating in the same condition, uh, when bentonite, bentonite was, was, was added to the system, you have a decrease of the, the permeation flow, uh, flux that was below the one that we observed when there were only external concentration polarization. And also when uh, aeration was put back on, the, um, it was not possible to come back to the same level as uh, it was observed with the eye water and uh, the, the more cycles and more difference in between the two behaviors. That is showing that uh, in that case, 
um, there were some fouling occurring. And in that case, the the implemented uh, um, the implemented uh, system aeration was not sufficient to for fouling mitigation. Then we, we we've been working on various um, fouling mitigation technique, and in fact we have good results, and we can remove fully uh, fouling at least uh, bentonite fouling in such systems. Um, then, yes, I, I, maybe I will uh, move a bit faster now. Uh, we've been working on the configuration with a hollow fiber module. So we made a uh, hollow fiber submerged module based on the aquaporin uh, uh, hollow fiber module. What we observe, again, very similar to platen frame, that aeration has a similar impact. Uh, uh, and you have to create turbulences to avoid uh, external concentration polarization and fouling mitigation. Um, and then uh, what we, we've been doing here, it was also in, um, in collaboration with ICRA, is, uh, it was also like a concentration of raw sewage. So the idea was to, to evaluate this submerged plate, uh, larger scale submerged plate for uh, raw sewage concentration. What you can see here is the initial raw sewage, and uh, in that case, it was after three times concentration. So we didn't reach like uh, 20 uh, times like um, Emil mentioned, but uh, which which seems very ambitious. And uh, in that case, what we observe, for example, is that it was possible to concentrate the, the, the COD without major falling clogging issue. In fact, with those modules, we operate them for several months and only by providing a, a bit of aeration from time to time, osmotic backwashing, we never really had uh, any issue, no clogging at all, uh, very limit, limited fouling over time. So um, it was like a bit of a surprise, but also a validation that uh, we could uh, concentrate raw, raw wastewater with that type of system. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty good news. And also following this, following up on this study, what we, we've been doing is uh, that, um, also uh, a study on uh, rejection of pharmaceutical, which was very high. We could reach like a same concentration factor of pharmaceutical as for the water of the for the feed water, so pretty high rejection of most of them. And also, what we observe is that we could improve the biogas production uh, thanks to the concentration. So, a bit in line with uh, what I've been showed before, uh, you can by preconcentrating uh, wastewater using forward osmosis it's uh, possible to optimize the, the, the digestion and to limit the size of, of the uh, anaerobic uh, membrane bioreactor of digester. Then, um, well, uh, published a review last week, uh, last year, um, due to, well, when I was uh, closed at home due to lockdown period, then I had time to read and, and write a bit, but uh, vale. Vale. yeah. FO could be considered as a, as a concentration process. And um, basically, it has several um, potential applications for wastewater, but also nutrients recovery, um, brine uh, towards the liquid discharge, uh, treating some various effluents like uh, we, we saw with uh, digestate, also some potential for liquid food beverage, uh, protein concentration. Um, of course, this is something maybe we can we can discuss in the in the remaining time of this webinar. What are the most uh, promising application of of FO? And then, well, regarding the project, what what's next? Uh, well, to continue to develop knowledge on fundamental of mass transfer, uh, to improve FO efficiency, um, especially permeation flux, uh, rejection of specific components. You hear me? I don't know what happened. I hope I'm still online. There you are. Um, sure. Yes? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, you. Yes, okay. hear you. Thanks. And uh, well, large scale validation uh, of the module. I, I will finish now.
and uh, personally I will I will follow up on the FO and wastewater concentrations through a new grant I just I just received uh, starting next month with a foundation like Aisha. So we'll be uh, in Girona again working on Lekia and trying to combine uh, FO with various uh, advanced um, biological treatment to try to optimize the production of valuable, valuable content from, uh, from wastewater. So that's it. Uh, thanks uh, for your attention. I think we are now re uh, arriving to the, the, fi like the, the final Q&A session. Maybe if you have some more generic comments as well. We have like 15 minutes to, to wrap up the, the webinar. Thanks again for, for being here. Um, maybe I will start with the, the question from the chat uh, regarding the, the second session. So we had a couple of questions from uh, for Esther, one from Soham. Uh, regarding the the interest to to do uh, FO fertigation uh, or just simply putting an MBR and then um, adding um, uh, just the fertilizer to the to the water treated from the MBR. Maybe I saw you have uh, answered, but maybe good if you can uh, reply live and to all the audience is there hello hello yes well my my answer was that i hear you like i hear me uh, echo uh, so my answer was that yeah of course we can we can have other types of uh, treatment but the rejection with forward osmosis is higher and with this we also don't need to apply extra pressure as we do with the with the mbr so that should be more efficient, but of course we have to improve those predictions of the like the passage of the fertilizers to the fit side because if not, it's not, it's not uh, yeah applicable. Yeah. Okay. And there were another question from WhatsApp uh, about scaling issue. No, sorry. Uh, yeah, like in the membrane surface in uh, fertigation. We didn't expect any scaling. Like we we evaluated uh, with the water flux, so it didn't decrease. So we can assume that we didn't have any scaling issues. And also, uh, I was asked about the the passage was what it does depend on. I said some things, but there are also others. So yeah, it depends on the size. So the hydrated, not the molecular weight, but the hydrated size of the molecules that we are playing with, the the presence of other salts, the concentration, other parameters like the time, the contact time, the speed, the temperature, the pH. So it depends on on many things. But here we were focused on the yeah on the ions. Okay, and I see also that uh, what WhatsApp is uh, is mentioning that it could be interesting for islands in Thailand, so maybe interested to, I to try mind. to implement this yep. system as a there, no? Yeah. <laughs> that would be nice. Mm -hmm. um, yes, um, there is a question from Emil. Uh, regarding this, the presentation of Sergi, the, regarding the difference between anaerobic digestion and anaMBR. Um, well, I will Here. I will answer the question. Although it's uh, well, thank you, Emil, for your for your question. I think the, it's well, it's it's not easy to to answer the question. But the main point here uh, is that well, typically digesters in wastewater treatment plants uh, are used for treating high uh, solids content and 
such as uh, sewage sludge, well, uh, waste activated sludge, primary sludge, and yeah, well, typical anaerobic digesters does not really need uh, to decouple HRT from the SRT because you have a uh, sewage flow rate uh, um, relatively low uh, in comparison to municipal sewage, and you have a high concentration of solids, uh, which also made it difficult to implement a membrane system there. But besides that, uh, it's also uh, in, in anaerobic digestion systems in which, in which water treatment plants is not really used. It's not really needed to decouple the HRT from the SRT. Here, the point is that when we treat uh, municipal sewage, um, uh, we have a high volumetric flow rate. We have a low concentration of COD of organic matter, even if we concentrate the the cons uh, the, um, the municipal sewage, we will reach like uh, with 10, if we concentrate 10 times the municipal sewage, which I think there is really a high concentration factor. I, uh, we will uh, reach concentration of uh, six grams CO the liter if we consider an initial concentration of 600 milligrams. So, well, in this case, it's really important to decouple the HRT from the SRT. So here the membrane is the key point to decouple the HRT from the SRT. And we are using, and this is the main implication to implement an NMBR in comparison to a an, uh, typical anaerobic digester. But here, um, I guess that another point uh, that we should highlight is that, well, we could also treat the wastewater with other high-grade anaerobic digesters because there are other configurations such as USB, EGSB. So USB has been tried in, uh, well, uh, has been indeed, an MBR has not been yet tested for municipal sewage treatment. And USB has been tested primarily in uh, warm climates, in climates with uh, um, with uh, high temperatures. Now I've seen a paper with, about USB. I think that was published like two weeks ago. I saw that it was published in Bioresource Technology, which showed the operation of a full-scale USB system for uh, in England. So I think that if it's a good operation in England, I guess that in Spain, for instance, would also be a good operation. But well, it depends on many factors. But uh, in general, USB are operated in warm climates because, well, uh, even if you can decouple the HRT from the SRT with USB systems, with USB reactors, uh, it's not always possible, primarily because of the low temperatures. Uh, we have many uh, uh, washout of uh, slides. So it's not always easy to get a good performance by means of a USB system when working at low temperatures. So the idea of an MBR is to get a compound decoupling of the HRT from the SRT, a perfect, uh, an excellent um, retention of the anaerobic biomass in the system, a slow growing anaerobic biomass in the system, especially at low temperatures. So if we implement the, an MBR, although probably uh, to implement a USB would be more simple in terms of operation and, all, and even in terms of economic feasibility because, well, a USB system does not require a membrane system and a membrane system is an expensive system. But I think that in this case, what is important in NMBR is in terms of operation, in terms of uh, effluent quality, which is also really important uh, currently to get a, a good effluent quality, especially if we consider that regulations are uh, getting, um, well, more restrictive. So, well, uh, I think that, I don't know if I've, I've tried to answer no, no, the good. question. <laughs> Good, uh, good answer. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And well, regarding uh, full, well, the economic feasibility, I think you asked the question just when Sergi started to present the technical analysis. So I guess you you have yes. some answers. Typically on the digestion part. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, well, the, the the other point, as uh, Sergi mentioned just now, also is that by increasing the COD through FO concentration, probably it will make more sense also to to implement this uh, anaerobic digester or an NBR in a for like a, for municipal wastewater. And uh, what else? I yeah, I saw some comments on the on my presentation. Thank you. Uh, well, so Ham, uh, well, we're still, uh, well, on our side for the moment, we're, we're just working on the on the proof of concept and the development of modules. So now we are capable of producing some module uh, commercialization um, that has not really been our focus so far, but um, 
that could be an ID. Uh, why not? We, we can always uh, provide some module for you to try if needed. And um, you're regarding the question of Emil, plate distance, uh, influence of air cleaning, ECP. Uh, yeah, on, on plate distance, I mean, in relation to this plate distance, that's what I mean. In relation to the distance, you mean? Yeah, yeah, especially play distance. Well, I think uh, the the play distance would be very similar to what you can find in a in a MBR. So, um, in terms of uh, design, that should be very similar. The only difference is that the um, if you think just of uh, a system that is not coupled with biological treatment, so it's just like a, a concentration of yeah. raw water or whatever. Um, the, 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 the quantity of air that you have to provide is, is like, uh, I think we did the comparison, it's like 20, typically 20 times lower than what you, you will typically uh, put in a MBR. Hmm. So, well, we still have to work on that to refine yeah. and also depending on type of fallant, etc. But uh, the, um, a very, very uh, low amount of air seems to be sufficient to provide the turbulences to break the concentration polarization layer. Okay, and uh, coarse bubble aeration, I guess, you were referring to? Uh, no, it was not especially coarse, which we did not know, it was more mm -hmm. fine bubbles. All right, oh, interesting. Okay, thanks. Uh, and uh, WhatsApp uh, is also inviting for everybody for membrane science and technology that will be all in Phuket in uh, August 2020. I don't think so, but um, 2022, I guess. Uh, well, uh, sorry, 2022. Uh, 2022. Yes, 2022. Yeah. And also, I see we have uh, a comment from Soham that is uh, referring to uh, osmotic assisted reverse osmosis for brain concentration. So, um, yes, uh, they have already some, uh, some um, commercial scale uh, application of that type of technology using uh, FO in a way in India, if I remember well and uh, feel free to contact him if you want to have some uh, more uh, insight on that. Well, I think uh, more or less we are done. Uh, maybe some last, uh, if the, the presenter wanted to make a last uh, comment, share their views on the potential of FO, where we are now, what, what will be the potential uh, application. I don't know if you have some uh, comments on that. I'm sure Emil has. Um, sure. I, uh, there we are again. I'll try to keep it small. Yeah, the, the FO, I, I didn't present it. Uh, I had to cut it out, but the market opportunities for, for FO, if I do recall, it's been a while. But um, yes, yeah, specifically still niche applications, right? I mean, uh, it, uh, for concentration uh, uh, purposes, um, yeah, this is this is the area of of FO which uh, let's say it might be the low hanging fruit. The, the areas we investigate, especially desalination, which is yeah, don't see a lot of massive work on that anymore. But like pre concentration wastewater treatment and 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 and. Uh, uh, that's an interesting uh, uh, topic, but there's still a couple of challenges to 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 over overcome. So this is a bit of a longer like uh, range uh, uh, aims that also aligns with a, a lot of the presentations I saw uh, today. Yeah, there are still some some hurdles to overtake, uh, and 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 every kind of effort in this this uh, direction, whether it be a submerged uh, FO as Gaetan just presented, or an alternative kind of. Uh, uh, um, uh, system kind of uh, design. It's yeah, it's all very interesting uh, towards uh, that goal. Yeah. I quit now. <laughs> no, perfect. I don't know if there are some people uh, from Odia Lab or even from uh, I don't know Aquaporin or um, other companies. Uh, Soham maybe also as well have their 
kind of uh, say on the where do they see uh, potential for FO in terms of commercialization and future? Yes, so I'm. Yeah, hi. Uh, sorry, my video is off, but yes. Uh, well, FO is very promising to us. I mean, as I said, we are already already into this space. We have a commercial installation. We did. Uh, uh, we have a pilot plant which we ship around the country here in India, and we have tested at probably around eight or nine sites. And, uh, but that's more like an OARO application, a high pressure FO in a way, and that's tubular. And and of course there are challenges, there are challenges with fouling and all that, which we are trying to address. But FO is very very promising to me, and and especially submerged FO that you were talking about, Gaten, is is surely something which excites me. Thank you. Anybody wanted to add something? Otherwise, uh, I think um. We will uh, wrap up this uh, this webinar. It was uh, the pleasure to have uh, all of you uh, on board and to a good opportunity to share a bit uh, about the FO knowledge. I think I don't know. For me, it was uh, it's been a while since I've been talking about uh, FO with other FO people, let's say, and uh, it was with uh, great pleasure. So well, keep in touch. Thanks, thank you, thanks to all the presenters for, for their nice presentation, to everybody for being here, to uh, to the um, to the communication team and especially Marina to, to help us to organize this uh, this day. And uh, well, hope to see you soon. Bye bye.